Success Books presents The Compound Effect. Multiply your success one simple step at a time by Darren Hardy. Read by the author. Before we jump into the book, I wanted to take just a quick moment to thank you for honoring me with your time and attention and for joining me on this amazing journey. We have poured a lot of love and care into this book and now this audio program to be the very best it could be so it really could make a transformational difference in your life. You will learn that I am fastidious about delivering results, tangible, measurable results. To do that, this piece of work needed to be world class. I believe, and I hope that you'll agree, that what we have crafted for you here is a powerful resource that will help you create the life you desire. I also want to express my excitement about having the ability to use this audio book format to help make the concepts in the compound effect come alive for you. You see, a printed book has some confinements as it requires strict guidelines of flow, pace, voice, and perspective. You have to color within the line, so to speak. This isn't to mention the many editors taking their red pen sword and slashing away at my text. So in the final editing stages of the book, we had to cut several of the compelling stories, tips, and insights from some of my favorite interviews with several of today's most amazing thought leaders. Well, I'm thrilled to tell you that as we take this journey together through the audiobook, I'm going to include back in those additional anecdotes and ideas from some of today's super achievers that I've had a chance to work with and interview. This will help reinforce, add clarity, depth, color, and texture to the key ideas we'll discover together in our trip through the compound effect. You will also learn how these critical principles have been utilized and lived out in the lives and success stories of the many extraordinary people you now read about in the pages of success and everywhere else. And one last note, on thecompoundeffect.com, I've provided you with a whole slew of additional and free downloadable printable resources that will further help you define your goals and help you track your progress so you can be sure the principles and the knowledge you'll gain are transferred into action and thus results in your life. Now, get ready to multiply your success, one simple step at a time. Before we jump into the introduction, let me exercise one of the important principles of the compound effect by paying gratitude to the two men who made me and this book possible. This book is dedicated to Jerry Hardy, my best man, my dad, the man who taught me the principles of the compound effect through his own life's example. and to Mr. Jim Rohn, my mentor, the man who taught me, amongst many things, to talk about things that matter to people who care. Introduction This book is about success and what it really takes to earn it. It's time somebody told it to you straight. You've been bamboozled for too long. There's no magic bullet, secret formula, or quick fix. You don't make $200,000 a year spending only two hours a day on the internet. Lose 30 pounds in a week. Rub 20 years off your face with a cream. Fix your love life with a pill. Or find lasting success with any other scheme that is too good to be true. Hey, wouldn't it be great if you could buy your success, fame, self-esteem, good relationships, health and well-being in a nicely clamshelled plastic package at the local Walmart. But that's not how it works. Look, we are constantly bombarded with increasingly sensational claims to get rich, get fit, get younger, get sexier, all overnight with little effort and for three easy payments of $39.95. These repetitive marketing messages have distorted our sense of what it really takes to succeed. We've lost sight of the simple but profound fundamentals of what it really takes to be successful. I'm tired of it. I won't sit back and watch these reckless messages derail people any longer. I wrote this book to take you back to the basics. I'm going to help you clear the clutter and bring focus to the core fundamentals that matter.
you will be able to immediately implement in your life the exercises and time-tested principles this book contains to produce measurable and sustainable results. I'm going to teach you to harness the power of the compound effect, the operating system that has been running your life, for better or for worse, whether you know it or not. Use this system to your advantage and you truly can revolutionize your life. You've heard you can achieve anything you set your mind to, right? Well, only if you know how. The compound effect is the operator's manual that teaches you how to master the system. When you do, there's nothing you can obtain or achieve. So how do I know that the compound effect is the only process you need for ultimate success? Firstly, I've proven these principles to work in my own life, for real. Now, I hate it when authors beat their chest about their fame and fortune, but I think it's important that you know that I speak from personal experience, having done it myself. I'm offering you living proof, not regurgitated theory. The principles you'll read in this book are the reason why I was earning more than a million dollars a year by age 24 and built a company to do more than 50 million by age 27. For the past 20 years, I've been intensely studying success and human achievement. My own life has been a personal laboratory of such, of study and research. I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars testing thousands of different ideas, resources, and philosophies. Through my own failings and triumphs, I've figured out which ideas and strategies have merit and which are sheer malarkey. My personal experience has proven that no matter what you learn or what strategy or tactic you employ, success comes as a result of the operating system of the compound effect. Secondly, for the past 16 years now, I've been a leader in the personal development industry, working closely with hundreds of top writers, speakers, and thought leaders. I've trained tens of thousands of entrepreneurs, advised many large companies, and personally mentored dozens of top CEOs and high-performance achievers. From thousands of those case studies, I've extracted what really matters and what works and what doesn't. Thirdly, as publisher of Success Magazine, I sift through thousands of article submissions and books, help choose the experts we feature in the magazine, review all of their material, and each month I interview a half dozen top experts on a multitude of success topics and drill down to their best ideas. All day, every day, I am consuming sorting, filtering, and wading through an ocean of personal achievement knowledge. Here's my point. When you have such an exhaustive view of an entire industry and the wisdom gained through studying the teachings and best practices of some of the world's most successful people, an amazing clarity emerges. The underlying fundamental truths become crystal clear. Having seen it, read it, and heard most of it, I can no longer be fooled by the latest gambit or self-proclaimed profit with the newest quote-unquote scientific breakthrough. Nobody can sell me on the latest gimmick. I have too many reference points. I've gone down too many roads and learned the truth the hard way. As my mentor, the great business philosopher Jim Rohn said, there are no new fundamentals. Truth is not new, it's old. You've got to be a little suspicious of the guy who says, hey, come over here. I want to show you my new manufactured antiques. No. You can't manufacture new antiques. They're old. What this book is about, with all the unnecessary noise, fat, and fluff removed, is what really matters. What really works. Those half a dozen basics that, if focused on and mastered, constitute the operating system that can take you to any goal you desire and help you live the life you were meant to live. This book contains those half a dozen fundamentals. They comprise the operating system called the compound effect. Let me put it to you as simply as I can, and it's this. Success is not doing 5,000 things really well. Success is doing a half dozen things really well 5,000 times. So the key then is, what are those half dozen things, and how do you do them really well? That is what this book details. Now, before we dig in, I do have one warning. Contrary to commercial promotion, Earning success is hard. The process is laborious, tedious, sometimes even boring. Becoming wealthy, influential, and world-class in your field is slow and arduous. Don't get me wrong, though. You will see results in your life from following these steps almost immediately. 
But if you have an aversion to work, discipline, and commitment, you're welcome to turn the TV back on and put your hope in the next infomercial. You know, the one with the circus barker touting promises of overnight success only if you have access to a major credit card and can call right now. Here's the bottom line. You already know all that you need to succeed. You don't need to learn anything more. If all we needed was more information, everyone with an internet connection would be living in a mansion, have abs of steel, and be blissfully happy. New or more information is not what you need. A new plan of action is. It's time to create new behaviors and habits that are oriented away from sabotage and toward success. It's that simple. You are about to discover a detailed, tangible plan of action. Let it shake up your expectations, eliminate your assumptions, ignite your curiosity, and bring value to your life, starting right now. This is the best of everything I've heard, seen, studied, and tried. It's the best of what we bring you every month in Success Magazine, all in one life-changing little book. And it is simple. So, are you ready? In good Jim Rohn fashion, if you're ready, say, I'm ready. Okay, let's get started. Chapter 1, The Compound Effect in Action You know that expression, slow and steady wins the race? Ever heard of the story of the tortoise and the hare? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm the tortoise. Give me enough time and I will beat virtually anybody, anytime, in any competition. Why? Not because I'm the best or the smartest or the fastest. I'll win because of the positive habits I've developed and because of the consistency I'll use in applying those habits. I'm the world's biggest believer in consistency. I'm living proof that it's the ultimate key to success. Yet, it's one of the biggest pitfalls for people struggling to achieve. Most people don't know how to sustain it. I do, and I have my father to thank for that. In essence, he was my first coach for igniting the power of the compound effect. I was a strange child, I admit. I think I was born an adult. My parents divorced when I was only 18 months old, and my dad raised me as a single father. He wasn't exactly the soft, nurturing type. He was a former university football coach, and he hardwired me for achievement. Thanks to Dad, wake-up calls were at 6 a.m. every morning, and not by a loving tap on the shoulder or even the soft sounds of a radio alarm. No, I was awakened each morning by the repetitious, pile-driving sound of iron pounding on the concrete floor of our garage, which was situated right next to my bedroom. It was like waking up 12 feet from a construction zone. He had painted a huge, no pain, no gain sign on the wall of the garage, which he stared at while he did his countless old-school strongman deadlifts, power cleans, lunges, and squats. Rain, sleet, or shine, Dad was out there in his shorts and tattered sweatshirt. He never missed a day. You could set your watch by his routine. I had more chores than a housekeeper and gardener put together. Upon returning from school, there was always a list of instructions to greet me. Pull weeds, rake leaves, sweep the garage, dust, vacuum, do the dishes, you name it. And getting behind in school wasn't tolerated. That's just the way it was. Dad was the original, no excuses guy. We weren't ever allowed to stay home from school sick unless we were actually puking, bleeding, or quote-unquote showing bone. The term showing bone came from his coaching days. His players knew that they weren't allowed to come out of the game unless they were seriously injured. One time his quarterback asked to be pulled out of a game, and Dad said, not unless you're showing bone. The quarterback pulled back his shoulder pads, and sure enough, his collarbone was sticking out of his neck skin. Only then was he allowed to come off the field. One of Dad's core philosophies was, it doesn't matter how smart you are or aren't, you need to make up in hard work what you lack in experience, skill, intelligence, or innate ability. If your competitor is smarter, more talented or experienced. You just need to work three or four times as hard. You can still beat him. No matter what the challenge, he taught me to make up in hard work for wherever I might be disadvantaged. Miss free throws at the game? Do 1,000 free throws every day for a month. Not good at dribbling with your left hand? Tie your right hand behind your back and dribble for three hours a day. 
behind in your math. Hunker down, hire a tutor, and work like hell all summer until you get it. No excuses. If you aren't good at something, work harder, work smarter. He walked his talk too. Dad went from being a football coach to a top salesperson. From there, he became the boss and ultimately went on to own his own company. But I wasn't given loads of instruction. From the beginning, Dad let us figure it out. He was all about taking personal responsibility. He didn't hammer on us every night about homework. We just had to show up with the results. And when you did, you were celebrated. If we got good grades, Dad would take us to this place called Prings, an ice cream parlor where you could get these giant king banana splits, six scoops of ice cream, and all the fixings. Sometimes my siblings didn't fare as well in school, so they didn't get to go. Getting to go was a big deal, so you worked your butt off to win the trip. Dad's discipline served as an example for me. Dad was my idol. I wanted him to be proud of me. I also lived in fear of disappointing him. One of his philosophies is, "Be the guy who says no. It's no great achievement to go along with the crowd. Be the unusual guy, the extraordinary guy." That's why I never did drugs. He never harped on me about it, but I didn't want to be that guy who just went along because everybody else was doing it, and I didn't want to let Dad down. Thanks to Dad. By age twelve, I had mastered a schedule worthy of the most efficient CEO. Sometimes I griped and moaned, "Hey, I was a kid," but even then, I secretly liked knowing that I had an edge over my classmates. Dad gave me a serious head start on the discipline and mentality it takes to be dedicated and responsible to achieve whatever I set out to achieve. Hey, it's no accident that the tagline of Success Magazine is "What Achievers Read." Today, Dad and I joke about what an addictive overachiever he trained me to be. At 18, I was making a six-figure income in my own business. By age 20, I owned my own home in an upscale neighborhood. And as mentioned before, by age 24, my income grew to more than a million a year. And by age 27, I was officially a self-made millionaire with a business that brought in more than 50 million dollars in revenue. That just about brings us to present day, because I'm not yet 40. But have enough money and assets to last my family the rest of my life. To this, Dad says, "Hey, there are a lot of ways to screw up a kid. At least my way was a pretty good one. You seem to have done pretty well. You haven't experienced the payoff of the compound effect. The compound effect is the principle of reaping huge rewards from a series of small, smart choices. Whether you're using this strategy for improving your health." Relationships, finances, or anything else for that matter, the changes are so subtle they're almost imperceptible. These small changes offer little or no immediate result, no big win, no obvious "I told you so" payoff. So why bother? Most people get tripped up by the simplicity of the compound effect. For instance, they quit after the eighth day of running because they're still overweight. Or they stop practicing the piano after six months because they haven't mastered anything other than chopsticks. Or they stop making contributions to their IRA only after a few years because they could use the cash, and it doesn't seem to be adding up to much anyway. What they don't realize is that these small, seemingly insignificant steps, completed consistently over time, will create a radical difference. Let me give you a few detailed examples. Before the examples, remember this formula. Small, smart choices plus consistency plus time equal radical difference. Visible. Now understand, it's the same small mathematical growth improvement each day that makes the compounded penny worth ten million seven hundred thirty-seven thousand four hundred eighteen dollars and twenty-four cents on day thirty-one, more than three times your three million. In this example, we see why consistency over time is more important. On day 29, you've got three million. Penny Lane has around 2.7 million. It isn't until day 30 that she pulls ahead with 5.3 million, and it isn't until the very last day of this month-long ultra marathon that your friend blows you out of the water and she ends up with the 10 million to your three million. Very few things are as impressive as the magic of compounding pennies. Amazingly, this force is equally powerful in every area of your life. Here's another example. 
Three friends. Let's take three buddies who all grew up together. They live in the same neighborhood with very similar sensibilities. Each makes around fifty thousand a year. They're all married. They have average health and body weight, plus a little bit of that dreaded marriage flab. Friend number one. Let's call him Larry. Plods along doing as he's always done. He's happy, or so he thinks, but complains occasionally that nothing ever changes. Friend number two. We'll call Scott. He starts making some small, seemingly inconsequential, positive changes. He begins reading ten pages of a good book a day and listening to thirty minutes of something instructional or inspirational just on his commute to work. Scott wants to see changes in his life, but doesn't want to make a big fuss over it. He recently read an article with Dr. Mehmet Oz in Success Magazine and chose one idea from the article to start implementing in his life. He's going to cut out 125 calories from his diet every day. No big deal. We're talking about maybe a cup of cereal less, trading a can of soda for a bottle of seltzer, switching from mayo to mustard on a sandwich—all doable. He also started walking a couple extra thousand steps a day, less than a mile. No grand acts of bravery or effort—stuff anyone could do. But Scott is determined to stick with these choices, knowing that even though they're simple, he could also easily be tempted to abandon them. Friend number three, we'll call Brad. Brad starts making a few poor choices. He recently bought a new big screen TV so he could watch more of his favorite programs. He's been trying out some of those recipes he's seen on the Food Channel. You know, some of those cheesy casseroles and the desserts that are his favorites. Oh, and he installed a bar in his family room and added just one alcoholic drink per week to his diet. Nothing crazy. Brad just wants to have a little more fun. So, at the end of five months, there are no perceivable differences between Larry, Scott, or Brad. Scott continues to read a little bit every night and listens to audios during his commute. Brad is quote unquote enjoying life and doing less. Larry keeps doing as he's always done, even though each man has his own pattern of behavior. Five months isn't long enough to see any real decline or improvement in their situation. In fact, if you charted the weight of the three men, you'd see a rounding error of zero. They look exactly equal. At the end of ten months, and then again fifteen months, we can't see any noticeable changes in any of their lives. It's not until we get to the end of the eighteenth month that the slightest differences are measurable in the appearances of the three friends. Even so, there's nothing of any valued consequence that they would recognize differing the three of them. But about month twenty-five, we start seeing really measurable, visible differences. At month twenty-seven, we see an expansive difference. And by month thirty-one, the change is startling. Brad is now fat, while Scott is trim. By simply cutting out a hundred and twenty-five calories a day, in just thirty-one months, Scott has lost thirty-three pounds. In case you're skeptical or curious, here's the math: thirty-one months equals nine hundred and forty days. Nine hundred and forty days times one hundred and twenty-five calories a day equals one hundred seventeen thousand five hundred calories saved. 117,500 calories saved times one pound divided by 3,500 calories equals 33 and a half pounds lost. Now, on the other side of the equation, Brad ate only 125 calories more. Remember, as small as a bowl of cereal a day in the same time frame, and gained 33 and a half pounds. Now he weighs 67 pounds more than Scott, but the differences are more significant than weight. Scott invested almost 1,000 hours in reading good books and listening to self-improvement audios. By putting his newly gained knowledge into practice, he's earned a promotion and a raise. Best of all, his marriage is thriving. Brad, he's unhappy at work, and his marriage is on the rocks. And Larry, Larry is pretty much exactly where he was two and a half years ago, except now he's a little bit more bitter about it. By the way. Let me jump off and talk a little bit more about Larry here. Larry represents the vast majority of people. They aren't climbing new heights and accomplishing great feats, and they aren't in a death spiral downward either. They are in what Tony Robbins called in our January 2009 interview in no man's land. He said this is a place where you're not really happy, but you're not unhappy enough to do anything about it. That's a dangerous place. It's a place where people numb themselves to their dreams. It's where they dismiss hope and accept what's in front of them instead of driving towards what they really want in life. Don't ever be a Larry. 
Don't get stuck in the no man's land of complacency and status quo. There's no standing still. You are either green and growing or ripening and rotting. There really is no in between. Okay, back to the book. The phenomenal power of the compound effect is simple. The difference between people who employ the compound effect for their benefit compared to their peers who allow the same effect to work against them is almost inconceivable. It looks miraculous, like magic or quantum leaps. After 31 months or 31 years, the person who uses the positive nature of the compound effect appears to be a overnight success. In reality, his or her profound success was a result of small, smart choices completed consistently over time. Get it? The ripple effect. The results in the previous example seem dramatic, I know, but it goes even deeper than that. The reality is that even one small change can have a significant impact that causes an unexpected and unintended ripple effect. Let's put one of Brad's bad habits under the microscope, eating rich food more frequently. To better understand how the compound effect can also work in a negative way and can create a ripple effect that impacts your entire life. Brad makes some muffins from a recipe he learned on the Food Channel. He's proud of it and his family loves it and so it seems to add value all around. He starts making them and other sweets frequently. He loves his own cooking and eats a little bit more than his share but not so much that anyone notices. However, the extra food makes Brad sluggish at night. He wakes up a little groggy, which makes him cranky. The crankiness and sleep deprivation begin to impact his work performance. He's less productive and as a result, gets discouraging feedback from his boss. By the end of the day, he feels dissatisfied with his job and his energy level is way down. The commute home seems longer and more stressful than ever. All of this makes him reach for even more comfort food. Stress has a way of doing that. The overall lack of energy makes Brad less likely to take walks with his wife like he used to. He just doesn't feel like it. She misses their time together and takes his withdrawal personally. With fewer shared activities with his wife and an absence of fresh air and exercise, Brad's not getting the endorphin release that would make him feel upbeat and enthusiastic. Because he's not as happy, he starts finding fault with himself and others and stops complimenting his wife. And his own body starts to feel flabby and he feels less self-confident, less attractive and becomes less romantic. Brad doesn't realize how his lack of energy and affection towards his wife affects her. He just knows that he feels funky. He starts losing himself in late night TV because it's easy and distracting. Feeling the distance, Brad's wife starts to complain, then becomes needy. When that doesn't work, she emotionally withdraws to protect herself. She's lonely. She pours her energy into her work and spends more time with her girlfriends to fulfill her need for companionship. Men start flirting with her, which makes her feel desirable again. Now, she would never cheat on Brad, but he has a feeling that something's wrong. Instead of seeing that his poor choices and behaviors are at the root of the problem, he finds fault with his wife. Believing that the other person is wrong rather than looking inside and doing the work necessary to clean up your mess is basic psychology 101 stuff. In Brad's case, he doesn't know to look inside. They don't offer self-improvement or relationship advice on Top Chef or his other favorite crime shows. Now, if he had read the personal development books his buddy Scott has read, maybe he would have learned about ways to change negative habits and start making vegetable juices instead of desserts, you know, at least some of the time. Unfortunately for Brad, the small choices he made on a daily basis created that ripple effect that wreaked havoc on every area of his life. Now, of course, all that calorie counting and intellectual stimulation has had the opposite effect with Scott, who's now reaping the bounty of positive results. It's that simple. With enough time and consistency, the outcomes become visible. Better yet, they're totally predictable. The compound effect is predictable and measurable. And that's great news. Isn't it comforting to know that you only need to take a series of tiny steps consistently over time to radically improve your life? Doesn't that sound easier than mustering up some grand show of bravery and heroic strength only to wear yourself out and have to drum up all that energy again at a later date for another try, which will most likely be unsuccessful as well? I'm exhausted just thinking about it. But that's what people do. 
We've been conditioned by society to believe in the effectiveness of great displays of massive effort. Heck, it's downright all-American. Success, old school. The most challenging aspect of the compound effect is that we have to keep working away at it for a while, consistently and efficiently, before we begin to see the payoff. Our grandparents knew this, though. They didn't spend their evenings glued to the TV watching infomercials about how to have thin thighs in 30 days or a real estate kingdom in six months. I bet your grandparents worked six days a week, from sun up to sundown, using the skills they learned in their youth and repeating them throughout their entire life. They knew the secret was hard work, discipline, and good habits. It's always interesting to me that wealth tends to skip a generation. Overwhelming abundance often leads to a lackadaisical mentality, which brings about a sedentary lifestyle. Children of wealth are especially susceptible. They weren't the ones who developed the discipline and character to create the wealth in the first place. So it makes sense that they might not have the same sense of value for wealth or understand what's necessary to keep it. We frequently see this entitlement mentality in children of royalty, movie stars, and corporate executives, and to a lesser degree, in children and adults everywhere. As a nation, our entire populace seems to have lost appreciation for the value of a strong work ethic. We've had two, if not three generations of Americans who have known great prosperity, wealth, and ease. Our expectations of what it really takes to create lasting success, like grit, hard work, and fortitude, they just aren't alluring and thus have been mostly forgotten. We've lost respect for the strife and struggle of our forefathers. The massive effort they put forth instilled discipline, chiseled their character, and stroked the spirit to brave new frontiers. The truth is, complacency has impacted all great empires, including but not limited to the Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and English. Why? Because nothing fails like success. Once dominant empires have failed every time for this reason, people get to a certain level of success and get too comfortable. Having experienced extended periods of prosperity, health, and wealth, we become complacent. We stop doing what we did to get us there. We become like the frog in the boiling water that doesn't jump to his freedom because the warming is so incremental and insidious that he doesn't notice that he's getting cooked. If we want to succeed, we need to recover our grandparents' work ethic. It's time to restore our character, if not for the sake of saving America, at least for your own greater success and achievement. Don't buy into the genie in a lamp idea. You can sit on your couch, waiting to attract checks into your mailbox, rub crystals together, walk on fire, channel that 2,000-year-old guru, or chant affirmations if you want to, but much of that is hocus-pocus commercialism, manipulating you by appealing to your weaknesses. Real and lasting success requires work, and lots of it. I have a quick, real-time story to illustrate this nothing-fails-like-success concept. A great new restaurant opened up close to my home on the beach in San Diego. In the beginning, the place was always immaculate. The hostess had a big welcoming smile for everyone. The service was impeccable. The manager always came over to assure it. And the food was sensational. Soon people lined up to eat there and would often wait more than an hour to be seated. Then, unfortunately, the restaurant staff began to take its success for granted. The hostess became snooty, the service staff disheveled and curt, and the food hit or miss. The place was out of business within 18 months. They failed because of their success, or rather, because they stopped doing what made them successful to begin with. Their success clouded their perspective, and they slacked off. Microwave mentality. Understanding the compound effect will rid you of the insta-results expectation. The belief success should be as fast as your fast food, your one-hour glasses, your 30-minute photo processing, your overnight mail, your microwave eggs, your instant hot water and text messaging. Enough, okay? 
Promise yourself that you're going to let go, once and for all, your lottery winner expectations. Because, let's face it, you only hear the stories about the one winner, not the millions of losers. That person you see jumping up and down in front of the Vegas slot machine or at the horse track race doesn't reveal the hundreds of times that same person lost. If we go back to our mathematical chance of a positive result again, we have a rounding error of zero, as in, you have about zero chance of winning. Harvard psychologist Daniel Gilbert, author of Stumbling on Happiness, says, if we gave lottery losers each 30 seconds on TV to announce not, I won, but I lost, it would take almost nine years to get through the losers of a single drawing. When you understand how the compound effect works, you won't pine for quick fixes or silver bullets. Don't try to fool yourself into believing that a mega successful athlete didn't live through regular bone crushing drills and thousands of hours of practice. He got up early to practice and kept practicing long after others had stopped. He faced the sheer agony and frustration of the failure, loneliness, hard work and disappointment it took to become number one. By the end of this book or even before, I want you to know it in your bones that the only path to success is through a continuum of mundane, unsexy, unexciting, and sometimes difficult daily disciplines compounded over time. Know, too, that the results, the life, and the lifestyle of your dreams can be yours when you put the compound effect to work for you. If you use the principles outlined in the compound effect, you will create a fairy tale ending. Okay, have I made my point? Good. Now, before we go into the next chapter, I want to remind you that in the book, I provide you with a summary of action steps, taking the key principles that we've covered in Chapter 1 so you can start integrating them into your life. Remember this. Knowledge is not power. It's potential power. It's like energy in a light switch. Until you turn it on, taking action, the power is useless. Knowledge uninvested is wasted. Or as Jim Rohn would say, Ideas without action leads to delusion. So don't forget to go back, capture the key points, and start taking action on them today. Now, coming up in the next chapter, we will focus on the one thing that controls your life. Every victory or defeat, triumph or failure, has started with this. Everything you have or don't have in your life right now has been because of this. Learn to change this and you can change your life. Let's discover what this is. Chapter 2 Choices We all come into this world the same, naked, scared, and ignorant. After that grand entrance, the life we end up with is simply an accumulation of all the choices we make. Our choices can be our best friend or our worst enemy. They can deliver us to our goals or send us orbiting into a galaxy far, far away. Think about it. Everything in your life exists because you first made a choice about something. Choices are at the root of every one of your results. Each choice starts a behavior that over time becomes a habit. Choose poorly and you just might find yourself back at the drawing board forced to make new, often harder choices. Don't choose at all, and you've just made the choice to be the passive receiver of whatever comes your way. In essence, you make your choices, and then your choices make you. Every decision, no matter how slight, alters the trajectory of your life, whether or not you go to college, who you marry, to have that last drink before you drive, to indulge in gossip or stay silent, to make one more prospecting call or call it a day, to say I love you or not. Every choice has an impact on the compound effect of your life. This chapter is about becoming aware of and making choices that support the expansion of your life. Sounds complicated, I know, but you'll be amazed by its simplicity. No longer will 99% of your choices be unconscious. No more will most of your daily routines and traditions come as a reaction to your programming. You'll ask yourself and be able to answer, 
How many of my behaviors have I not voted on? What am I doing that I didn't consciously choose to do, yet continue to do every day? By employing the same idiot-proof strategies I've used to catapult my own life and career, strengthened by the compound effect, you'll be able to loosen up the mysterious grip of these things that are unwinding your life and pulling you in the wrong direction. You'll be able to hit the pause button before stumbling into idiot territory yourself. You'll experience the ease of making decisions that lead to behaviors and habits that support you every time. Your biggest challenge isn't that you've intentionally been making bad choices. Heck, that would be easy to fix. Your biggest challenge is that you've been sleepwalking through your choices. Half the time, you're not even aware that you're making them. Our choices are often shaped by our culture and upbringing. They can be so entwined in our routine behaviors and habits that they seem beyond our control. For instance, have you ever been going about your business, enjoying your life, when all of a sudden you made a stupid choice or a series of small choices that ultimately sabotaged your hard work and momentum, all for no apparent reason? You didn't intend to sabotage yourself, but by not thinking about your decisions, weighing the risks and potential outcomes, you found yourself facing unintended consequences. Nobody intends to become obese, go through bankruptcy, or get a divorce. But often, if not always, those consequences are a result of a series of small, poor choices. Elephants don't bite. Have you ever been bitten by an elephant? How about a mosquito? See, it's the little things in life that will bite you. Occasionally, we see big mistakes, threaten to destroy a career or a reputation in an instant. The famous comedian who rants racial slurs during a stand-up routine. The drunken anti-Semitic antics of a once-celebrated humanitarian. The anti-gay rights senator caught soliciting gay sex in a restroom. The admired female tennis player who uncharacteristically threatens an official with a tirade of expletives. Clearly, these types of poor choices have major repercussions. But even if you've pulled a whopper like that in your past, it's not the extraordinary massive steps backwards or the tragic single moments that we're concerned with here. For most of us, it's the frequent, small, and seemingly inconsequential choices that are of grave concern. I'm talking about the decisions you think don't make any difference at all. It's those little things that inevitably and predictably derail your success. Whether they're boneheaded maneuvers, no biggie behaviors, or are disguised as positive choices, those are especially insidious, these seemingly insignificant decisions can completely throw you off course because you're not mindful of them. You get overwhelmed, space out, and become unaware of the little actions that take you way off course. The compound effect works all right. It always works, remember? But in this case, it works against you because you're unaware of what you're doing. You're sleepwalking. For instance, you inhale a soda and a bag of potato chips suddenly realize only after you've polished off the last chip that you blew an entire day of healthy eating and you weren't even hungry. You get caught up and lose two hours watching mindless TV. Scratch that. Let's give you some credit and make it a educational documentary before realizing you spaced out preparing for an important presentation to land a valuable client. You blurt out a knee-jerk lie to a loved one for no good reason, when the truth would have worked just fine. What's going on? You've allowed yourself to make a choice without thinking, and as long as you're making choices unconsciously, you can't consciously choose to change that ineffective behavior and turn it into productive habits. It's time to wake up and make empowering choices Thanksgiving year-round it's easy to point fingers at others isn't it I'm not getting ahead because of my lame boss I would have gotten that promotion if it hadn't been for that backstabbing co-worker I'm always in a bad mood because my kids are driving me crazy and we are particularly gifted in the finger pointing department when it comes to our romantic relationships you know where the other person is the one who needs to change a few years back, a friend of mine was complaining about his wife. From my observation, she was a terrific lady, and he was lucky to have her, and I told him as much. But he continued to point out all the ways that she was responsible for his unhappiness. 
That's when I shared an experience that literally changed my marriage. One Thanksgiving, I decided to keep a Thanksgiving journal for my wife. Every day for an entire year, I logged at least one thing that I appreciated about her. It could be as simple as the way she interacted with her friends, how she cared for our dogs, the fresh bed she prepared, a succulent meal that she whipped up, or just the beautiful way that she styled her hair that day, whatever. I looked for the things my wife was doing that touched me or revealed attributes, characteristics, or qualities that I appreciated. I wrote them all down secretly for an entire year. By the end of that year, I had filled an entire journal. When I gave it to her the following Thanksgiving, she cried, calling it the best gift she'd ever received, and even better than the BMW I'd given her that year for her birthday. The funny thing was this. The person most affected by this gift was me. All that journaling forced me to focus on my wife's positive aspects. I was consciously looking for all the things that she was doing right. That heartfelt focus overwhelmed anything that I might have otherwise had to complain about. I fell deeply in love with her all over again, maybe even more than ever as I was seeing the subtleties in her nature and behavior instead of just her more obvious qualities. My appreciation, gratitude, and intention to find the best in her was something that I held in my heart and eyes each day. This caused me to show up differently in my marriage, which of course made her respond differently to me. Soon I had even more things to write in my Thanksgiving journal. As a result of choosing to take a mere five minutes every day or so to document all the reasons why I was grateful for her, we experienced one of the best years of our marriage, and it's only gotten better. After I shared my experience, my friend decided to keep a Thanksgiving journal about his wife. Within the first few months, he completely turned around his marriage. Choosing to look for and focus on his wife's positive qualities changed his view of her, which changed how he interacted with her. As a result, she made different choices about the way she responded to him. The cycle perpetuated, or shall we say, compounded. Let me jump off script here for a second. Before we move past the concept of gratitude, let me pass on a little tip Montel Williams shared with me that I've incorporated into my life that's really helped my mind focus on the abundance and blessings I enjoy. I use this strategy right before I go to sleep so that my mind spends the night conjuring up ways to create more abundance and blessings. Here's what Montel told me. He said, put a little piece of paper by your bed with a pen. I use a journal so I can archive these great thoughts. And before you go to sleep, I want you to write down three things that happened today that you're thankful for. And as I will explain later, I also write down any unique observations about people, life, or myself, or what I call aha ideas, quotes, or insights collected from the day. Another insight from John Maxwell is to not only identify and enjoy the feeling of being grateful, but also express that feeling to others. Let me read to you what he said to me backstage at an interview at one of our success symposiums. He said, you know, our attitude is a choice, and to be grateful is a choice. And I know a lot of people who have a lot of blessings that aren't really grateful. I also know a lot of people who have very little and are very grateful. So it's not what you have. It's not possessions. It's not where you've arrived positionally. I think it's a spirit, and the attitude of gratitude to me is saying there have been others in my life that have done things for me I couldn't have done for myself. And the way to express, I think, indebtedness to people is by being grateful to them. The person that says, well, I'm grateful, I've just never expressed it, that's not adding value to anyone. Key point, John. So the lesson here is not only look for what you appreciate, but give that appreciation to others. And as the saying goes, what you appreciate, appreciates. Let's get back to the book. Owning a hundred percent. We are all self-made men and women, but only the successful take credit for it. I was 18 when I was introduced to the idea of personal responsibility at a seminar. And that concept completely transformed my life. If you threw out the rest of this book and only practiced this one concept, within two or three years, the changes in your life would be so great, your friends and family would have a difficult time remembering the old you. In that seminar that I attended at 18, 
The speaker asked, what percentage of shared responsibility do you have in making a relationship work? Now, I was a teenager, so wise in the ways of true love, of course I had all the answers. 50-50, I blurted out. It was obvious, right? Both people must be willing to share the responsibility evenly or someone's going to get ripped off. 51-49, yelled someone else, arguing that you have to be willing to do a little bit more than the other person. Aren't relationships built on self-sacrifice and generosity? 80-20, yelled another. The instructor turned to the easel and wrote 100-0 on the paper in big black letters. You have to be willing to give 100% with zero expectation of receiving anything in return, he said. Only when you're willing to take 100% responsibility for making the relationship work, will it work. Otherwise, a relationship left to chance will always be vulnerable to disaster. Whoa, this was not what I was expecting. But I quickly understood how this concept could transform every area of my life. If I always took 100% responsibility for everything I experienced, completely owning all of my choices and all the ways in which I responded to whatever happened to me, I held the power. Everything was up to me. I was responsible for everything I did, didn't do, or how I responded to what was done to me. I know you think you take responsibility for your life. I have yet to ask anyone who doesn't say, of course I take responsibility for my life. But when you look at how most people operate in the world, there's a lot of finger pointing, victimhood, blaming, and expecting someone else or the government to solve their problems. If you've ever blamed the traffic because you're late or decided that you're in a bad mood because of something your kid, spouse, or coworker did, you're not taking 100% responsibility. You arrived late because your printer was busy? Maybe you shouldn't have waited until the last minute. Your coworker messed up the presentation? Shouldn't you have double-checked it before delivering it? Not getting along with your unreasonable team? There are countless fantastic books and classes to help you learn how to deal. You alone are responsible for what you do, don't do, or how you respond to what's done to you. This empowering mindset revolutionized my life. Luck, circumstances, or the right situation wasn't what mattered. If it was to be, it was up to me. I was free to fly. No matter who was elected president, how badly the economy tanked, or what anybody said, did, or didn't do, I was still 100% in control of me. Through choosing to be officially liberated from the past, present, and future victimhood, I hit the jackpot. I had the unlimited power to control my destiny. Getting lucky. Maybe you believe you're simply just unlucky. But really, that's just another excuse. The difference between becoming fabulously rich, happy and healthy, or broke, depressed and unhealthy, is the choices you make throughout your life. Nothing else will make the difference. Here's the thing about luck. We are all lucky. If you are on the right side of the dirt, have your health, and a little food in your cupboard, you are incredibly lucky. Everyone has the opportunity to be lucky. Because beyond having the basics of health and sustenance, luck simply comes down to a series of choices. When I asked Richard Branson if he felt luck played a part in his success, he answered, yes, of course, we're all lucky. If you live in a free society, you are lucky. Luck surrounds us every day. We are constantly having lucky things happen to us, whether you recognize it or not. I have not been any more lucky or unlucky than anyone else. The difference is when luck came my way, I took advantage of it. Ah, spoken like a man, knighted with wisdom. While we're on the topic, it's my belief that the old adage we often hear, luck is when opportunity meets preparation, isn't enough. I believe there are two other critical components to luck. The complete formula for getting lucky. Here's the formula. Preparation, personal growth, plus attitude, belief and mindset, plus opportunity, that good thing coming your way, plus action, doing something about it, equals luck. Let's go through them one by one. Preparation. 
by consistently improving and preparing yourself, your skills, knowledge, expertise, relationships, and resources, you have the wherewithal to take advantage of great opportunities when they arise. Or as Richard Branson said, when luck strikes. Then you can be like Arnold Palmer who told us in his Success Magazine feature February 2009, it's a funny thing, the more I practice, the luckier I get. Attitude. This is where luck evades most people and where Sir Richard is spot on with his belief that luck is all around us. It's simply a matter of seeing situations, conversations, circumstances as fortuitous. You cannot see what you don't look for, and you cannot look for what you don't believe in. Opportunity. It is possible to make your own luck, but the luck I'm talking about here isn't planned for, or it comes faster or differently than expected. In this stage of the formula, luck isn't forced. It's a natural occurrence and often shows up seemingly of its own accord. And action. This is where you come in. However, this luck was delivered to you from the universe, God, the lucky charms, leprechaun, or from whomever or whatever you associate delivering your good fortune, it's now your job to act on it. This is what separates the Richard Bransons from the Joseph Wallingtons. Joseph who? Exactly. You've never heard of him. That's because he failed to take action on all the lucky things that happened to him. So, no more whining about the cards you were dealt, the great defeats you suffered, or any other circumstances. Countless people have had more disadvantages and greater obstacles than you, and yet they're wealthier and more fulfilled. Luck is an equal opportunity distributor. Lady Luck shines on us all, but rather than having your umbrella drawn, you gotta have your face to the sky. When it comes down to it, it's all you, baby. There's no other way around it. The High Price of Tuition at UHK, University of Hard Knocks. Nearly a decade ago, I was asked to be a partner in a new startup venture. I invested a considerable sum of money into the deal and worked tirelessly on it for nearly two years before finding out that my partner had mismanaged and squandered all the cash. I lost more than $330,000. I didn't try to sue him. In fact, I lent him more money later for a personal situation. The bottom line was the loss was my fault. I agreed to be his partner without doing enough due diligence on his background and personal character. During our time in business, I wasn't inspecting what I was expecting. I could justify it by saying I trusted him. But the truth was I was guilty of being lazy by not watching the finances more diligently. Not only had I made the choice to start this relationship and business, but I also made the choices to ignore the obvious red flags and warning signs. Because I chose not to be completely responsible for the business, in the end, I was responsible for the results. When I learned of the wrongdoings, I chose not to lose any more time fighting it. Instead, I licked my wounds, learned my lesson, and moved on. In hindsight, I'd make the same choice to pick up and move on again today. I now challenge you to do the same. No matter what has happened to you, take complete responsibility for it. Good or bad, victory or defeat, own it. My mentor Jim Rohn said, The day you graduate from childhood to adulthood is the day you take full responsibility for your life. Today is graduation day. From this day forward, choose to be 100% responsible for your life. Eliminate all of your excuses. Embrace the fact that you are freed by your choices, as long as you assume personal responsibility for them. It's time to make the choice to take control. Your secret weapon, your scorecard. I'm about to walk you through one of the single greatest strategies I've ever used in my personal development. This strategy helps me take control of the choices I make throughout the day, causing everything else to fall into place and leading to behaviors and actions that shepherd my habits in line like dutiful, loyal minions. Right this moment, pick an area of your life where you most want to be successful. Do you want to have more money in the bank? A trimmer waistline? The strength to compete in an Ironman event? A better relationship with your spouse or kids? Picture where you are in that area right now. 
Now picture where you want to be. Richer, thinner, happier, you name it. The first step towards change is awareness. If you want to get from where you are to where you want to be, you have to start becoming aware of the choices that lead you away from your desired destination. Become very conscious of every choice that you make today so you can begin to make smarter choices moving forward. To help you become aware of your choices, I want you to track every action that relates to the area of your life you want to improve. If you've decided you want to get out of debt, you're going to track every penny you pull out of your pocket. If you've decided you want to lose weight, you're going to track everything that you put into your mouth. If you decided to train for an athletic event, you're going to track every step you take, every workout you do. Simply carry around a small notebook, something you'll keep in your pocket or purse at all times, and a writing instrument. You're going to write it all down, every day, without fail, no excuses, no exceptions, as if Big Brother's watching you, as if my dad and I will come and make you do a 100 push-ups every time you miss. It doesn't sound like much, I know, writing things down on a little piece of paper, but tracking my progress and missteps is one of the reasons I've accumulated the success I've had. The process forces you to become conscious of your decisions, but as Jim Rohn would say, What's simple to do is also simple not to do. The magic is not in the complexity of the task. The magic is in the doing of simple things repeatedly and long enough to ignite the miracle of the compound effect. So beware of neglecting the simple things that make the big things in your life possible. The biggest difference between successful people and unsuccessful people is successful people are willing to do what unsuccessful people are not. Remember that. It'll come in handy many times throughout your life when faced with a difficult, tedious, or tough choice. Money Trap I learned the power of tracking the hard way after I acted like a colossal idiot about my finances. Back in my early 20s, when I was making a lot of money selling real estate, I met with my accountant. He said, You owe well over $100,000 in taxes. What? I said. I don't have that kind of cash just lying around. Why not? He asked. You collected several times that. Certainly you set aside the taxes that would be due on that money. Evidently I didn't, I said. Where did the money go? He asked. I don't know, I said. A sobering confession for sure. The money had passed through my hands like water. I hadn't even noticed. Then my accountant did me a great favor. Son, he said, looking me dead in the eyes, you've got to get a grip. I've seen this a hundred times before. You're spending money like a drunken fool, and you don't even know how to account for it. That's stupid. Stop it. You are now seriously in the hole. You have to earn more money that you'll owe additional taxes on just to pay for your back taxes. Continue this, and you'll dig your financial grave with your own wallet. Immediately, I got the message. Here's what my accountant had me do. Carry a small notepad in my back pocket and write down every single cent I spent for 30 days. Whether it was $1,000 for a new suit or 50 cents for air to fill up my tires, it all had to go down on the notepad. Wow! This brought an instantaneous awareness of the many unconscious choices I was making that resulted in money pouring out of my pockets. Because I had to log everything, I resisted buying some things just so I didn't have to take out the notepad and write it in that dang book. Keeping a money log for 30 days straight cemented a new awareness in me and created a completely new set of choices and disciplines around my spending. And since awareness and positive behaviors compound, I found myself being more proactive with money in general, putting away more for retirement, finding areas to save where there was clear waste, and enjoying the fun quotient of money, play money, all the more. When I did consider shelling out for entertainment, I did so only after a long pause. This tracking exercise changed my awareness of how I related to my money. It worked so well, in fact, that I've used it many times to change other behaviors. Tracking is my go-to transformation model for everything that ails me. Over the years, I tracked what I eat, what I drink, how much I exercise, how much time I spend improving a skill, my number of sales calls, 
even improvement of my relationships with my family, friends, or my spouse. The results have been no less profound than my money tracking wake up call. In buying this book, you're basically paying me for my opinion, my guidance. This is where I'm going to become kind of a hard ass and insist that you start tracking your behaviors for at least one week. This book isn't designed to entertain you. From some of my jokes, that's obvious. It's designed to help you get results. To get results, you have to take some action. You may have heard about tracking before. In fact, you've probably done your own version of this exercise. But I also bet you aren't doing it right now, right? How do I know? Because your life isn't working as successfully as you like. You've gotten derailed. Tracking is a way to get back on track. Do you know how casinos make so much money in Vegas? Because they track every table, every winner, every hour. Why do Olympic trainers get paid top dollar? Because they track every workout, every calorie, and every micronutrient for their athletes. All winners are trackers. Right now, I want you to track your life with the same intention to bring your goals within sight. Tracking is a simple exercise. It works because it brings moment to moment awareness to the actions you take in the area of your life that you want to improve. You'll be surprised at what you will observe about your behavior. You cannot manage or improve something until you measure it. Likewise, you can't make the most of whom you are, your talents, and resources and capabilities until you are aware of and accountable for your actions. Every professional athlete and his or her coach track each performance down to the smallest minutia. Pitchers know their stats on every pitch in their repertoire. Golfers have even more metrics on their swings. Professional athletes know how to adjust their performances based on what they've tracked. They pay attention to what they record and make changes accordingly. Because they know when their stats improve, they win more games and earn more in endorsement deals. At any given moment, I want you to know exactly how well you're doing. I'm asking you to track yourself as if you are a valuable commodity, because you are. Want that idiot proof system we talked about earlier? This is it. So regardless of whether you think you are aware of your habits or not, believe me, you're not, I'm asking you to start tracking. Doing so will revolutionize your life and ultimately your lifestyle. Keep it slow and easy. Don't panic. We're starting off with an easy breezy tempo here. Just track one habit for one week. Pick the habit that has the greatest control over you. That's where you'll start. Once you begin reaping the rewards of the compound effect, you'll naturally want to introduce this practice into other areas of your life. In other words, you'll choose to choose tracking. Let's say the category you choose is getting your eating under control because you want to lose weight. Your task is to write down everything you put into your face, from the steak, potatoes, and salad you had at dinner to the many little choices during the day. That handful of pretzels in the break room, that second slice of cheese on your sandwich, that fun-sized candy bar, that sample at Costco, those extra sips of wine after the host tops off your glass. Don't forget the beverages. They all add up. But unless tracked, they're easy to dismiss or forget because they seem so small. Again, merely writing these things down sounds simple, and it is, but only when you do it. That's why I'm asking you to commit to choosing a category and a start date now. So what will tracking look like? It will be thorough, as in organized, and relentless, as in constant. Each day, you'll start at the top of a fresh page and start keeping track. What happens after the first week of tracking? You'll probably be in shock. You'll be astonished at how those calories, pennies, minutes have been escaping you. You never even knew that they were there, let alone that they'd vanished. Now, keep going. You're going to track in this area for maybe three weeks. Maybe you're already groaning. I can hear it. You just don't want to do it. But trust me, you'll be so blown away by the results. After one week, you'll sign yourself up for another two. I can practically guarantee it. Why three weeks? You've probably heard psychologists say that something doesn't become a habit until you've practiced it for three weeks or so. It's not an exact science, but it's a good benchmark, and it has worked for me. So ideally, 
I want you to stick with your choice to track your behaviors for 21 days. If you refuse, I'm not going to lose any sleep. Heck, it's not my waistline, cardiovascular health, bank balance, or relationship you're messing with. But seriously, you're reading this book or listening to this audio because you want to change your life, right? And I promised you it was going to take slow, steady work, didn't I? This one action isn't easy, but it is simple and doable. So do it. Promise yourself to start today. For the next three weeks, choose to carry around your own small notepad or a large one if that's more enticing to you and write every single thing down in your category. What happens in three weeks? You move from the shock that follows the first week to the happy surprise of seeing how merely becoming conscious of your actions begins to shape them. You'll find yourself asking, do I really want that candy bar? I'm going to have to haul out my notebook and write it down and I'll feel a little sheepish. That's 200 calories saved right there. Turn down that candy bar every day and in a little more than two weeks, you will already have lost a pound. You'll start adding up that $4 coffee on the way to work and realize, holy cow, I've just spent 60 bucks on coffee in three weeks. Hey, that's a thousand bucks a year. Or compounded, that's $51,833.79 in 20 years. How much do you really need to stop for that coffee now? Come again, you say? Am I saying that your $4 a day coffee habit is going to cost you $51,833.79 in 20 years? Yes, I am. Did you know that every dollar you spend today, no matter where you spend it, is costing you nearly $5 in only 20 years and $10 in 30 years? That's because if you took a dollar and invested it at 8%, in 20 years that dollar would be worth almost 5 Every time you spend a buck today, it's like taking $5 out of your future pocket. I used to make the mistake of looking at a price tag and thinking that if an item was listed as $50, it cost me $50. Well, yes, in today's dollars, but take that $50 and look at the value it cost me over the next 20 years by not depositing it into my investment account, and it's really worth four or five times that amount. In other words, every time you look at an item that cost $50, ask yourself this, is this item really worth $250 to me? If it is worth $250 to you today, then it's worth buying. If it's not, it's not worth buying. Keep that in mind the next time you go to a place like Costco with all sorts of amazing things you didn't know you had to have. You go in to buy $25 worth of necessities and you walk out with $400 of stuff instead. I know, my garage looks like a Costco graveyard. Next time you walk into one of those bargain basement stores, assess things from this future value standpoint. Chances are you'll put down that $50 crepe maker so your future you will have $250 more in the bank. Make the correct choice every day, every week, for many years, and you can quickly see how you could become financially abundant. When you track with this awareness, you'll find yourself showing up in your life very differently. You'll be able to ask yourself, is having a coffee once every workday worth the eventual price of a Mercedes Benz? Because that's what it's costing you. Even more than that, you're not sleepwalking anymore. You are aware and conscious and making better choices. All from that little notebook and pen. Simply amazing, isn't it? The Unsung, Unseen Hero Once you start tracking your life, your attention will be focused on the smallest things that you're doing right, as well as the smallest things that you're doing wrong. And when you choose to make even the smallest course corrections consistently over time, you'll begin to see amazing results. But don't expect immediate fanfare. When I say small course corrections, I'm talking truly invisible. Chances are, no one's going to even notice them anytime soon. There will be no applause. No one's going to send you a congratulations card or a trophy for these disciplines. And yet, eventually, their compounding effect will result in an exceptional payoff. It's the littlest disciplines that pay off over time. The effort and preparation for the great triumph that happened when no one was looking. And yet the results are exceptional. A horse wins by a nose, but gets ten times the prize money. 
Is the horse ten times faster? No, just a little bit better. But it was those extra laps around the track, the extra discipline in the horse's nutrition, or the extra work by the jockey that made the results a slight bit better with compounded rewards. After hundreds of tournaments played and thousands of strokes tallied, the difference between the number one ranked golfer and the number ten golfer is an average of only 1.9 strokes. But the difference in prize money is five times, over 10 million versus 2 million. The number one golfer isn't five times better, not even 50% better or even 10% better. In fact, the difference between his average score is only 2.7% better. Yet the results are five times greater. That's the power of little things adding up. It's not the big things that add up in the end. It's the hundreds, thousands, or millions of little things that separate the ordinary from the extraordinary. To be one stroke better requires countless little things that don't get accounted for when you're putting on the green jacket. Let me give you a few more ways tracking small changes can result in huge payoffs. Take a walk. I was mentoring a CEO of a sizable company doing more than $100 million in sales annually. Phil was an entrepreneur and the founder of the company. The company was doing fine, but I detected a lack of engagement, trust, and enthusiasm in the culture of his organization. I wasn't too surprised to learn it turns out that Phil hadn't been in parts of his own building for more than five years. He'd never spoken personally to more than 80% of his staff. He basically lived in a bubble with his management team. I asked Phil to track just one change. Three times a week, he had to step out of his office and walk around the building. His goal was to seek out at least three people whom he saw doing things right or had heard good things about and give them some personal acknowledgement of his appreciation. This one small change in his behavior took less than an hour a week, but had massive effects over time. The employees Phil took the time to recognize began to go the extra mile and work hard to earn his greater appreciation. Other employees started to perform better, observing that great effort was recognized and appreciated. The ripple effect of their new attitude transferred to their customer interactions, improving the customer's experience with the company, increasing repeat and referral business, which increased everyone's pride. That simple change over a period of 18 months did a complete 180 in the company culture. Net profits grew by more than 30% during that time, utilizing the same staff and zero additional investment in marketing. All because Phil committed to one small, seemingly insignificant step done consistently over time. Money Tree. Twelve years ago, I had a wonderful assistant, Kathleen. She earned $40,000 a year at the time. One day, she was asked to manage the registration table situated at the back of the room during one of my lectures on entrepreneurship and wealth building. The next week, she came into my office and said, I heard you talking about saving 10% of everything you earn. That sounds nice, but there's no way I could do that. It's totally unrealistic. She proceeded to tell me about all her bills and financial obligations. After she wrote them all out, it was obvious that there really wasn't any money left over at the end of the month. I need a raise, she said. I'll do better than that, I told her. I'm going to teach you how to become wealthy. It wasn't the answer she was looking for, but she agreed. I taught Kathleen how to track her spending, and she began to carry her notebook. I told her to open up a separate savings account with only $33, just 1% of her existing monthly income. I then showed her how to live on $33 less the next month. Bring in her own lunch just one day a week instead of going downstairs to the deli and ordering a sandwich, chips, and a drink. The next month I had her save only 2%, $67. She saved the additional $33 by changing her cable subscription service. The next month we went up to 3%. We canceled her subscription to People Magazine. It was time for her to study her own life. And instead of going to Starbucks twice a week, I told Kathleen to buy the Starbucks beans and other fancy fixings and make her own coffee in the office. She grew to like that even better. Me too. By the end of the year, Kathleen was saving 10% of every dollar she earned without noticing a significant impact on her lifestyle. She was amazed. 
that one discipline also had a ripple effect on many other disciplines in her life. She calculated what she spent on mind-numbing entertainment and began investing that money on her personal growth instead. After feeding her mind with several hundred hours of inspirational and instructional content, her creativity started to soar. She brought me several ideas on how we could make and save more money in our organization. She presented me with a plan that she would implement in her spare time if I promised to reward her with 10% of all the money saving strategies and 15% of all the new revenue strategies that proved profitable. By the end of the second year, she was earning more than $100,000 a year on the same $40,000 base salary. Kathleen eventually started her own independent contract service business that took off. I ran into Kathleen at an airport two years ago. She now earns more than a quarter of a million dollars a year and has saved and created more than one million in assets. She is a millionaire. All starting from the choice to take one small step by starting to save $33 a month. On the topic of saving money, I want to give you a few extra tips that I picked up from some people who know what they're talking about. One is a way of reframing your savings account. This comes from Dr. Memonaz in an interview I did with him in 2008 when he said, I tithe to myself. This was true when I was making $29,000 as an intern, and it's true with my money right now. 10% of what I earn, I don't touch. It's as though I didn't earn that money. I don't actually put it aside for a rainy day. I'm putting it aside because that buys me peace of mind. Ah, a peace of mind account. I love that. Who wants to take their hard-earned money and stash it away for a rainy day? How fun and beneficial does that sound? But peace of mind? Yes, I want that, and it's worth spending, or, in this case, saving money to buy it. I think Dr. Oz puts the idea of savings into context. Thinking about buying peace of mind is a great way of reframing and understanding this important behavior. Speaking of behavior, let me share some insights Dave Ramsey passed on to the Success CD listeners and me. This is what he said, I am a thousand percent sure after working with hundreds of thousands of people over the last two decades that personal finance is about 80% behavior and it's only about 20% head knowledge. We all know what to do. It's doing it that's the problem. So the problem with my money is this idiot that I shave with every morning. He also said the first thing is you have to pay attention. You have to be purposeful. You have to be intentional, as we've been discussing, and as I coach Kathleen to do. Ramsey goes on to say, and the second thing is, this issue of just, oh, dare I say it aloud, maturity. Adults devise a plan and follow it. Children do what feels good. You have got to do the right thing every time, all the time. That's the number one indicator in your character towards becoming wealthy. Lastly, he cites, Handling money is a learned technique. 80% of American millionaires are first generation rich, which means they didn't have rich parents programming them. They decided to change. They made a choice to engage in different behaviors. Ah, thanks Dave. There it is again. It's about choices that lead to behaviors done long enough become habits that over time compound into our results. Wealth and financial abundance or bankruptcy, heartache, and despondency. The choices are small. The behavior changes almost unnoticeable, but the outcomes are profound by comparison. Time is of the essence. The earlier you start making small changes, the more powerfully the compound effect works in your favor. Suppose your friend listened to Dave Ramsey's advice and began putting $250 a month into an IRA when she got her first job after graduating from college at age 23. You, on the other hand, don't start saving until you're 40. Or maybe you started saving a little earlier but cleaned out your retirement account because you didn't notice any great gains. By the time your friend is 40, she never has to invest another dollar and will have more than $1 million by age 67 growing at 8% interest compounded monthly. You continue to invest $250 every month until you reach 67, the normal retirement age for Social Security for those born after 1960. That means you're saving for 27 years 
by contrast to her, 17 years. When you're ready to retire, you'll have less than $300,000 and will have invested $27,000 more than your friend. Even though you saved for many more years, invested much more cash, you still ended up with less than a third of the money you could have had. That's what happens when we procrastinate and neglect necessary behaviors, habits, and disciplines. Don't wait another day to start the small disciplines that will lead you in the direction of your goals. Now, are you telling yourself that you're already starting too late and you're already way behind the eight ball and can never catch up? That's just another tired tape in your head. It's time to turn it off. It's never too late to reap the benefits of the compound effect. Suppose you've always wanted to play the piano, but it feels too late because you're about to turn 40. If you start now, by the time you're at retirement age, you could be a master, as you will have been playing for 25 years. The key is to start now. Every great act, every fantastic adventure starts with small steps. The first step always looks harder than it actually is. But what if 25 years is too long? What if you've only got time or patience for 10 years? In Brian Tracy's book, Focal Point, he models how to improve any area of your life by a thousand percent. Not 10 percent or even a hundred percent, but a thousand percent. Let me outline it for you. All you have to do is improve yourself, your performance, your output, and your earnings by one tenth of one percent each workday. Yeah, you even get to slack off on the weekends. That's one one thousandth. Do you think you could do that? Of course. Anyone can do that. Simple. Do it each day of the week and you'll improve by one half percent each week. Translation, not much. Equaling two percent each month, which compounded adds up to 26 percent each year. Your income now doubles each 2.9 years. By year 10, you could be performing and earning a thousand percent of what you're earning right now. Isn't that amazing? You don't have to put in a thousand percent more effort or work a thousand percent more hours. Just one tenth of one percent improvement each day. That's it. While we're on this topic, when I asked Donnie Deutsch what the most important ingredient to success was, this was his answer. The most important thing I say is, are you learning every day? Are you growing every day? Are you being challenged every day? That is the key to success. The day that stops happening, the world is going to turn in the wrong direction for you. Harvey McKay said it this way, you don't go to school once for a lifetime. You're in school all of your life. And of course, Jim Rohn said it to me this way, formal education will make you a living, which is fine, but self-education will make you a fortune which is super fine. And lastly, this concept of constant and never-ending improvement is echoed in every endeavor. This is how the Iron Man, Cal Ripken Jr. said it when asked how he was able to beat the 56-year-old record made by Lou Gehrig's 2,131 consecutive games played. The Iron Man went on to surpass it another 502 straight starts. Cal said this, I think it's important, especially in this economy, you can't stay around if you're not getting better. No business or baseball team is going to keep people just because they show up. You have to constantly be looking for ways to get better and looking for ways to improve your value to the organization. You have to develop strong fundamentals, no matter what you do, and you have to make yourself indispensable. That requires you to be evaluating what you're doing and what needs to be done. Well said, Cal, and he should know. And now, you do too. Success is a half marathon. Beverly was a salesperson for an educational software company for which I was doing a turnaround. One day she told me about her friend who was running a half marathon the upcoming weekend. I could never do such a thing, Beverly, who was significantly overweight, assured me. I get winded going up a single flight of stairs. If you want to, you can choose to do what your friend is doing, I told her. She balked saying, there's absolutely no way. My first step was to help Beverly find her motivation. So Beverly, why would you want to run a half marathon in the first place? 
I was trying to get a handle on her greater, more personal desires and motivations. Well, my 20-year high school reunion is coming up next summer, and I want to look fabulous. But I've gained so much weight since my second child five years ago, I don't know how I could do it. Bingo! Now we had a motivating goal, but I proceeded with caution. If you've ever tried to lose weight, you probably know the drill. Buy an expensive gym membership, drop a fortune on personal trainers, new equipment, spiffy new workout clothes, and great athletic footwear. Work out vigorously for a week or so, then turn your elliptical machine into a clothes drying rack. Ditch the gym and let your sneakers mold in the corner. I wanted to try a better way with Beverly. I knew that if I could get her to choose just one new habit, she'd get hooked, and all the other behaviors would naturally fall in line. I asked Beverly to drive her car around the block and map out a one-mile loop from her house. Once she mapped the course, I told her to walk the loop just three times over a period of two weeks. Notice that I didn't ask her to start by running the mile. Instead, I started with something I knew she could do in her existing state—a small, easy task that required no major stretch. Then I had her walk the loop three times in one week for an additional two weeks. Each day, she made the choice to continue on. After she accomplished that, next I told Beverly to start a slow jog, only as far as she felt comfortable. As soon as she started feeling breathless, she was to stop and continue walking. I asked her to do this until she could run one fourth, and then one half, and then three quarters of that mile. It took three more weeks, nine outings, before she could jog a full mile. After a total of seven weeks, she was jogging the whole loop. That might seem like a long time for such a short victory, right? After all, a half marathon is 13.1 miles. One mile is nothing. What was something, however, was Beverly was beginning to see how her choice to get fit for the reunion, her why power, was fueling her new health habits. The compound effect had been set in motion and was starting its miraculous process. I then asked Beverly to increase her distance an eighth of a mile each outing, almost an unnoticeable length, maybe about 300 steps further. Within six months, she was running nine miles without any discomfort at all. In nine months' time, she was running 13 and a half miles regularly, more than the distance of a half marathon, as part of her regular running routine. More exciting, though, is what happened in other areas of her life. Beverly lost her craving for chocolate, a lifelong obsession, and heavy fatty foods gone. The increased energy she felt from her cardiovascular exercise and better eating choices helped to bring more enthusiasm to her work. Her sales performance doubled during the same period, which was great for me. As we saw in the previous chapter, the ripple effects of all this momentum raised her self-esteem and sense of accomplishment, and made her. More affectionate and intimate with her husband, their relationship became more passionate than it had been since college. Because she had renewed energy, her interaction with her children became more active and animated. She noticed she no longer had time to hang out with her Debbie Downer friends, who still gathered together after work for greasy appetizers and drinks. She made new healthy friends in a running club she joined, which led to a whole host of additional positive choices, behaviors, and habits. Following that first conversation in my office and Beverly's decision to find her why power and commit to a series of small steps, she lost more than 40 pounds, becoming a walking and running billboard for fit and empowered women. Today, Beverly regularly runs full marathons. Your life is a product of your moment-to-moment -moment choices. In our success CD, May of 2010. TV's Biggest Loser fitness trainer Jillian Michaels shared with me a powerful childhood story. She said, "When I was a kid, my mom would have these elaborate Easter egg hunts for me. I would run around the house, and when I would get close to a hidden egg, she'd say, 'Oh, you're warm. You know, you're getting closer to it. Oh, you're on fire. And when you move away from the egg, she'd go, 'Oh, you're cold. You're freezing.' She goes on to say." I teach contestants that on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, I need them to think about their happiness and their ultimate goal as being warm. How every choice and every decision they make in the moment is getting them closer to that ultimate goal. Since your outcomes are the result of your moment-to-moment -moment choices, 
You have incredible power to change your life by changing those choices. Step by step, day by day, your choices will shape your actions until they become habits, where practice makes them permanent. Losing is a habit. So is winning. Now let's work on permanently instilling winning habits into your life. Eliminate sabotaging habits and instill the needed positive habits and you can take your life in any direction you desire to the heights of your greatest imagination. Let me show you how. Before we go into Chapter 3, I want to remind you once again, go to the book, look at the summary action points, and be sure that you're implementing them into your life. Chapter 3, Habits. A wise teacher was taking a stroll through the forest with a young pupil and stopped before a tiny tree. Pull up that sapling, the teacher instructed his pupil, pointing to a sprout just coming up from the earth. The youngster pulled it up easily with his fingers. Now pull up that one, said the teacher, indicating a more established sapling that had grown to about knee-high to the boy. With little effort, the lad yanked the tree up, roots and all. And now this one, said the teacher, nodding toward a more well-developed evergreen that was as tall as the young pupil. With great effort, throwing all his weight and strength into the task, using sticks and a stone he found to pry up the stubborn roots, the boy finally got the tree loose. Now, the wise one said, I'd like you to pull up this one. The young boy followed the teacher's gaze, which fell upon a mighty oak so tall the boy could scarcely see the top. Knowing the great struggle he had just had pulling up the much smaller tree, he simply told his teacher, I'm sorry, but I can't. My son, you have just demonstrated the power that habits will have over your entire life, the teacher exclaimed. The older they are, the bigger they get, the deeper the roots grow, and the harder they are to uproot. Some get so big with roots so deep, you might even hesitate to try. Creatures of Habit Aristotle wrote, We are what we repeatedly do. Merriam-Webster defines habit this way, an acquired mode of behavior that has become nearly or completely involuntary. There's a story about a man riding a horse galloping quickly. It appears that he's going somewhere very important. A man standing alongside the road shouts, Where are you going? The rider replies, I don't know. Ask the horse. This is the story of most people's lives. They're riding the horse of their habits with no idea where they're headed. It's time to take control of the reins and move your life in the direction of where you really want it to go. If you've been living on autopilot and allowing your habits to run you, I want you to understand why and I want you to let yourself off the hook. After all, you're in good company. Psychological studies reveal that 95% of everything we feel, think and do and achieve is a result of a learned habit. We're born with instincts, of course, but no habits at all. We develop them over time. Beginning in childhood, we learned a series of conditioned responses that led us to react automatically, as in without thinking, to most situations. In your day-to-day -day life, living automatically has had its definite positives. If you had to consciously think about every step of each ordinary task, making breakfast, driving the kids to school, getting to work, and so on, your life would grind to a halt. You probably brush your teeth twice a day on autopilot. There's no big philosophical debate. You just do it. You strap on your seatbelt the minute your butt hits the seat. No second thoughts. Our habits and routines allow us to use minimal conscious energy for everyday tasks. They help keep us sane and enable us to handle most situations reasonably well. And because we don't have to think about the mundane, we can focus our mental energy on more creative and enriching thoughts. Habits can be helpful, as long as they're good habits, that is. If you eat healthfully, you've likely built healthy habits around the food you buy and what you order at restaurants. If you're fit, it's probably because you work out regularly. If you're successful in a sales job, it's probably because your habits of mental preparation and positive self-talk enable you to stay optimistic in the face of rejection. I've met with and worked with many great achievers, CEOs, and superstars, and I can tell you they all share one common trait. They all 
have good habits. That's not to say they don't have bad habits. They do, but not many. A daily routine built on good habits is the difference that separates the most successful amongst us from everyone else. And doesn't that make sense? From what we've already discussed, you know that successful people aren't necessarily more intelligent or more talented than anyone else, but their habits take them in the direction of becoming more informed, more knowledgeable, more competent, better skilled, and better prepared. My dad used Larry Bird as an example to teach me about habits when I was a kid. Larry Legend, as he was called, is known as one of the greatest professional basketball players of all time. But he wasn't known for being the most athletically talented player. Nobody would have described Larry as graceful on the basketball court. Yet, despite his limited natural athletic ability, he led the Boston Celtics to three world championships and remains one of the best players of all time. How did he do it? It was Larry's habits, his relentless dedication to practice and to improve his game. Larry Bird was one of the most consistent free throw shooters in the history of the NBA. Growing up, his habit was to practice 500 free throw shots every morning before school. With that kind of discipline, Larry made the most of his God-given talents and kicked the butts of some of the most gifted players on the court. Like Larry Legend, you too can condition your automatic and unconscious responses to be those of a developed champion. This chapter is about choosing to make up for what you lack in innate ability with discipline, hard work, and good habits. It's about becoming a creature of champion habits. With enough practice and repetition, any behavior, good or bad, becomes automatic over time. That means that even though we developed most of our habits unconsciously by modeling our parents. Responding to the environmental or cultural associations, or creating coping mechanisms, we can consciously decide to change them. It stands to reason that since you learned every habit you have, you can also unlearn the ones that aren't serving you well. Ready? Here goes. Start thinking your way out of the instant gratification trap. We do understand that scarfing pop tarts won't slenderize our waistlines. We realize that logging three hours a night watching Dancing with the Stars and NCIS leaves us with three fewer hours to read a good book or listen to a terrific audio. We get that merely purchasing great running shoes doesn't make us marathon ready. We are a rational species. At least that's what we tell ourselves. So why are we so irrationally enslaved by so many bad habits? It's because our need for immediate gratification can turn us into the most reactive, non-thinking animals around. Now, if you took a bite of a Big Mac and immediately fell to the ground, clutching your chest from a heart attack, you might not go back for that second bite. If your next puff of a cigarette instantly mutated your face into that of a weathered 85-year-old. Chances are you'd pass on that too. If you failed to make that tenth call today and were immediately fired and bankrupted, suddenly picking up the phone would be a no-brainer. And if that first forkful of cake instantly put fifty pounds on your frame, saying、uh, "no thank you" to dessert would be a true piece of cake. The problem is this. The payoff or the instant gratification we enjoy derived from the bad habits. Often far outweighs what's going on in your rational mind concerning long-term consequences. Indulging in our bad habits doesn't seem to have any negative effects at all in the moment. You don't have that heart attack. Your face doesn't shrivel up. You're not standing in the unemployment line, and your thighs aren't thunderous. But that doesn't mean you haven't activated the compound effect. It's time. To wake up and realize that the habits you indulge in could be compounding your life into repeated disaster. The slightest adjustments to your daily routines can dramatically alter the outcomes in your life. Again, I'm not talking about quantum leaps of change or a complete overhaul to your personality, character, and life. Super small, seemingly inconsequential adjustments can and will revolutionize everything. The best illustration I can give you to emphasize the power of small adjustments is that of a plane traveling from Los Angeles to New York City. 
If the nose of that plane is pointed only 1% off course, almost an invisible adjustment when the plane is sitting on the tarmac in Los Angeles, it will ultimately end up about 150 miles off course, arriving in either upstate Albany or in Dover, Delaware. Such is the case for your habits. A single, poor habit, which doesn't look like much in the moment, can ultimately lead you miles off course from the direction of your goals and the life you desire. Most people drift through life without devoting much conscious energy to figuring out specifically what they want and what they need to do to take themselves there. I want to show you how to ignite your passion and help you aim your unstoppable creative power in the direction of your heart's dreams and desires. Uprooting bad habits that have grown into mighty oaks is going to be arduous and difficult, and to see the process through will require something greater than even the most relentless determination. Willpower alone won't cut it. Finding your mojo, your why power. Assuming willpower is what you need to change your habits is akin to trying to keep a hungry grizzly bear out of your picnic basket by covering the basket with a napkin. To fight the bear of your bad habits, you'll need something stronger. When you're having trouble doing the hard work of achieving your goals, it's common to believe that you simply lack willpower. I disagree. It's not enough to choose to be successful. What's going to keep you consistent with the new positive choices you need to make. What's going to stop you from falling back into your mindless bad habits? What's going to be different this time versus the times you've tried and failed before? As soon as you get the slightest bit uncomfortable, you're going to be tempted to slide back into your old, comfortable routine. You've tried willpower before, and it's failed you. You've set resolutions, and you've let them go. You thought you were going to lose all that weight last time. You thought you'd make all those sales calls last year. Let's stop the insanity and do something different so you can get different and better results. Forget about willpower. It's time for why power. Your choices are only meaningful when you connect them to your desires and dreams. The wisest and most motivating choices are the ones aligned with that which you identify as your purpose your core self, and your highest values. You've got to want something and know why you want it or you'll end up giving up too easily. So, what is your why? You've got to have a reason if you want to make significant improvements to your life. And to make you want to make the necessary changes, your why must be something that is fantastically motivating to you. You've got to want to get up and go, go, go go for years so what is that that moves you the most identifying your why is critical what motivates you is the ignition to your passion the source for your enthusiasm and the fuel of your persistence this is so important that I made it the focus of my first book designing your best year ever a proven formula for achieving big goals you must know your why why everything's possible the power of your why is what gets you to stick through the grueling mundane and laborious all of the hows will be meaningless until your whys are powerful enough until you've set your desire and motivation in place you'll abandon any new path you seek to better your life if your why power your desire isn't great enough if the fortitude of your commitment isn't powerful enough you'll end up like every other person who makes a New Year's resolution and gives up too quickly and reverts back to sleepwalking through their poor choices. Let me give you an analogy to help bring this home. If I were to put a 10-inch wide, 30-foot long plank on the ground and say, if you walk the length of this plank, I'll give you $20. Would you do it? Of course you would. It's an easy 20 bucks. But what if I took that same plank and made a rooftop bridge between two 100-story buildings? That same $20 for walking the 30-foot plank no longer looks desirable or even possible, does it? You'd look at me and say, not on your life. However, if your child was on the opposite building and that building was on fire, would you walk the length of that plank to save him? 
without question, and almost immediately, you'd do it, $20 or not. So why is it the first time I asked you to cross that sky-high plank, you would have said, no way, no how, but the second time, you wouldn't have hesitated. The risks and the dangers were the same. What changed? What changed was your why, your reason for wanting to do it. You see, when the reason is big enough, you will be willing to perform almost any how. To truly ignite your creative potential and inner drive, you have to look beyond the motivation of monetary and material goals. It's not that those motivations are bad. In fact, they're great. I'm a connoisseur of nice things, too. But material stuff can't really recruit your heart, soul, and guts into the fight. That passion has to come from a deeper place. And even if you do acquire the shiny objects, you won't capture the real prize, happiness and fulfillment. In my interview with peak performance expert Tony Robbins in January of 2009, he said, I've seen many business moguls achieve their ultimate goals, but still live in frustration, worry, and fear. So what's preventing these people from being happy? The answer is they have focused only on achievement and not fulfillment. Extraordinary accomplishment does not guarantee extraordinary joy, happiness, love, and a sense of meaning. These two skill sets feed off each other and makes me believe that success without fulfillment is failure. Well said. That's why it's not enough to choose to be successful. You have to dig deeper to find out your core motivation to activate your superpower, your why power. Core motivation. The access point to your why power is through your core values, which define both who you are and what you stand for. Your core values act as your navigation system through life. Your core values are the values that you would fight for and defend to the death. These values make up your character. They are your non-negotiables in life. They are the attributes you would hope others would say about you in your absence and in your departure. They become what you are known for. They become your internal compass, your guiding beacon. They comprise the filter through which you will run all of life's demands, requests, and temptations to see if they match the direction you want to sail your life toward. If you haven't clearly defined your values, you may end up making choices that conflict with them. And when your actions conflict with your values, the results are unhappiness, frustration, and despondency. Psychologists tell us that nothing creates internal stress and trauma more than when what you're doing on the outside, your actions and behaviors, is incongruent with your values on the inside. Let me jump off here on this point in particular. I like how Tony Jerry said it in one of our success interviews when he said, so many people set goals, they go after those goals, but they have friction sometimes with their values. For example, if your values is to be a really great family person, but you set some high financial goals that takes you away from your family, then there's going to be some friction. So what I suggest is that you really be congruent with what's important to you, your values. So you don't have that friction and you can move forward every day to get better and better results. Yes, this is a key point. As this friction, as Tony calls it, is our source of stress, frustration, dissatisfaction, and in some cases, severe disappointment or depression. When you live in alignment with your highest ideas, standards, and values, life is fun, easy, rich, and massively rewarding. Okay, let me continue. Defining your core values also helps make life simpler and more efficient. When you are certain of your core values, decision making is simplified. When faced with a choice, you simply ask yourself, does this align with my core values? If yes, do it. If no, don't and don't look back. Then all the fretting and punishing plagues of indecision will be eliminated. In our article with Rudy Giuliani, he said it this way. You need to have a set of principles that you develop and can stick to in good times and bad. You cannot wait for things to go awry before you start trying to figure out what your core values are. By then, it's too late and your ability to navigate yourself to your desired destination will be nearly impossible. Jim Rohn's father used to quip, when it's raining, it's too late to fix the roof. When it's sunny outside, the roof doesn't need fixing. 
Now is the time to get clear on who you really are, what's important to you, and who you really want to become. Your core values will help you navigate your life and keep you on course to your desired destination. Also, in my interview with the CEO and founder of Starbucks, Howard Schultz, he put this key concept this way, and this is a guy who knows a little bit something about creating culture and adhering to core values, as he grew from 150 stores to now almost 17,000 run by 142,000 employees. He said, whatever your culture, values, guiding principles, you have to take steps to incorporate them into your organization early in its life so that they can guide your every decision, every hire, every strategic objective you set. This is true for a large corporation, and it's just as true for you as an individual. Get your core values determined and squared away, and they will be your guiding principles for every decision, every project that you take on or say yes to, and every goal that you go for. Find your fight. People are either motivated by something they want or something that they don't want. Love is a powerfully motivating force, but so is hate. Contrary to social correctness, it can be good to hate. Hate disease, hate injustice, hate ignorance, hate complacency, and so on. Sometimes identifying an enemy lights your fire. Some of my greatest motivation, determination, and dogged persistence came when I had an enemy to fight. In history, most transformational stories and political revolutions came about as a result of fighting an enemy. David had Goliath. America had the British, Luke had Darth Vader, Rocky had Apollo Creed, 20-somethings have the man, Rush Limbaugh has the liberals, Lance Armstrong, cancer, Apple, Microsoft, Microsoft, Apple. We could go on and on, but I think you get the point. Enemies give us a reason to stand tall with courage. Having to fight challenges your skills, your character, and your resolve. It forces you to assess and exercise your talents and abilities. Without a motivating fight, we become fat and lazy. We lose our strength and purpose. Some of my mentorship clients worry that their why power derives from less than noble goals. They feel guilty for wanting to prove the naysayers wrong or wanting to get back at the person who said they'd never amount to anything or beat the competition or finally one-up a sibling who's always dominated them. But really, it doesn't matter what the motivation is, as long as it's legal and moral. You don't have to be motivated for great humanitarian reasons. What matters is that you feel fully motivated. Sometimes that motivation can help you use a powerfully negative emotion or experience to create an even more powerful and successful end. This is certainly true of one of history's most celebrated football coaches, Pete Carroll. When we featured Carol and success in September of 2008, he explained his early motivation like this. When I grew up, I was a little dink. I couldn't do much because I was just too small. It took me a couple of years to get to a place where I could be competitive. All that time, I was living with the fact that I was much better and I needed to fight to prove it. I was frustrated because I knew I could be special. Carol's need to fight ultimately brought out his greatness. On our March 2010 issue of Success, we featured an interview with acclaimed actor Anthony Hopkins. I was surprised to learn that his extraordinary talent and determination blossomed from anger. Hopkins admitted to being a horrible student, burdened with dyslexia and attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder before such a diagnosis even existed. He was shackled with the label Problem Child. He said, I was a source of worry for my parents. I had no apparent future because schooling and education were important, but I didn't seem to have the ability to grasp what was being taught to me. My cousins were all brilliant. I felt resentful and rejected by a whole society and was very depressed. Hopkins harnessed his anger. At first, it propelled him to fight to achieve success outside of academics or athletics. He discovered that he had a glimmer of talent in acting. So, he used his anger towards the belittling labels he had been given to fuel his commitment to the craft of acting. Today, Hopkins is considered to be one of the greatest actors alive. As a result of the fame and fortune he's acquired, 
Hopkins has been able to help countless other people in the fight to recover from substance abuse, in addition to supporting important environmental work. Though initially it wasn't grounded in a noble cause, his fight was clearly worthwhile. We can all make powerful choices. We can all take back control by not blaming chance, fate, or anyone else for our outcomes. It's within our ability to cause everything to change. Rather than letting past hurtful experiences zap our energy and sabotage our success, we can use them to fuel positive, constructive change. Goals. As I mentioned before, the compound effect is always working and it will always take you somewhere. The question is, where? You can harness this relentless force and have it carry you to new heights, but you must know where you want to go first. What goals, dreams, and destinations do you desire? When I attended the funeral of Paul J. Meyer, another mentor of mine, I was reminded of the richness and diversity of his life. He achieved, experienced, and contributed more than dozens of people combined. His obituary made me reassess the quantity and size of the goals that I set for myself. If Paul were here, he would tell us, if you are not making the progress that you'd like to make and are capable of making, it's simply because your goals are not clearly defined. One of Paul's most memorable quotes reminds us of the importance of goals. Whatever you vividly imagine, ardently desire, sincerely believe, and enthusiastically act upon must inevitably come to pass. The one skill most responsible for the abundance in my life is learning how to effectively set and achieve goals. Something almost magical happens when you organize and focus your creative power on a well-defined target. I've seen this time and time again. The highest achievers in the world have all succeeded because they mapped out their visions. The person who has a clear, compelling, and white-hot burning why will always defeat even the best of the best at doing the how. Let me jump off here for a second. When we asked what was one of the most important things the legendary Bobby Bowden did to make his team such a dominating force in college football, FSU won 12 Atlantic Coast Conference Championships and a total of 377 wins under Bowden's leadership. An extraordinary feat. He said, at the start of every season, we take about four days to get away from everything, including the phone, where people can't get to us. During that time, we discuss our goals. I talk about our goals for the year. I'm a big believer in setting goals. But more important to me than setting them is writing them down. Doing that makes me and everyone around me stay the course and stay accountable. And then we talk about how we're going to go about achieving them, breaking them all down and what everyone must do to reach each goal. We talk about what everybody's responsibility is and then what our responsibility is to the university and to the players. Oh, and another great point and perspective on the topic of goals was shared with me by John Asaraf. John said, when you write a goal, ask yourself, am I willing to trade my life for the accomplishment of this goal? Because essentially, that's what you're doing. Wow, what a great point and a great perspective. How many times have you seen people give major chunks of their life for the achievement of the wrong goals? I remember Jim Rohn saying, if I had known how much going for some of those early goals would have cost me, I probably wouldn't have paid the price. One last piece of advice I'd like to offer you when it comes to setting big goals for yourself is this. Before you write your business goals or your business plan, build your life plan. Figure out what kind of life you want to have first. Where do you want to live? What type of people do you want to be surrounded by? Whether you want to work nights and weekends, whether you want to travel and how much and where, whether you want to be home for dinner every night, if you want a short commute, what type of environment you want to go to each day, how you want to dress, etc. Then build your business or your professional plan around these criterion. Most of us have done exactly the opposite. I know I did for many years. We build our business plan first. We outline all our big goals, plans, and ambitions and then figure out how to fit our lives around them, usually sacrificing most of the rest of our life. 
Or sometimes we define a professional plan by outlining the money we want to make and the titles we want to obtain. Again, sacrificing much of the rest of our lives. If we continue to live this way, when we get to the end of our lives, we're likely to discover that we paid too high a price and sacrificed what was really important in life for too little. How goal setting actually works. The mystery, secret, revealed. You only see, experience, and get what you look for. If you don't know what to look for, you certainly won't get it. By our very nature, we are goal-seeking creatures. Our brain is always trying to align our outer world with what we are seeing and expecting in our inner world. So, when you instruct your brain to look for the things that you want, you will begin to see them. In fact, the object of your desire has probably always existed around you, but your mind and eyes weren't open to seeing it. In reality, this is how the law of attraction really works. It is not the mysterious, esoteric voodoo that it sometimes sounds like. It's far simpler and more practical than that. We are bombarded with billions of sensory, visual, audio, physical, bites of information each day. To keep ourselves from going insane, we ignore 99.9% .9 of them, only really seeing, hearing, or experiencing those upon which our mind focuses. This is why when you think something, it appears that you are miraculously drawing it into your life. In reality, you're now just seeing what was already there. You are truly attracting it into your life. It really wasn't there before or accessible to you until your thoughts focused and directed your mind to see it. Make sense? See, this isn't mysterious at all. In fact, it's quite logical. Now, with this new perception, whatever your mind is thinking internally is what it will focus on and all of a sudden see within that 99.9% .9 of the remaining space. Here's a well-worn example, because it's so true. In shopping for or buying a new car, all of a sudden you start to see that model and make everywhere, right? It seemed like there are tons of them on the streets all of a sudden when they weren't there yesterday. But is that realistic? Of course not. They were all there all along, but you weren't paying attention to them. Thus, they didn't really exist to you until you gave them your attention. When you define your goals, you give your brain something new to look for and focus on. It's as if you're giving your mind a new set of eyes from which to see all the people, circumstances, conversations, resources, ideas, and creativity surrounding you. With this new perspective and inner itinerary, your mind proceeds to match up the outside with what you want most on the inside, your goal. It's that simple. The difference in how you experience the world and draw ideas, people, and opportunities into your life after you have clearly defined your goals is profound. In one of my interviews with Brian Tracy, he put it this way, top people have very clear goals. They know who they are and they know what they want. They write it down and make plans for its accomplishment. Unsuccessful people carry their goals around in their heads like marbles rattling around in a can. And we say a goal that is not in writing is merely a fantasy. And everybody has fantasies, but those fantasies are like bullets with no powder in the cartridge. People go through life shooting blanks without written goals. And that's the starting point. So, I suggest that you take some time today to make a list of your most important goals. I recommend considering your goals in all aspects of your life, not just for your business or finances. Be wary of the high price of putting too much focus on any single aspect of your life to the exclusion of everything else. Go for whole life success, balance in all aspects of life that are important to you. Business, finance, health and well-being, spirituality, family and relationships, and lifestyle. Who you have to become. When most people set out to achieve their goals, they ask, okay, I have my goal. Now, what do I need to do to get it? It's not a bad question, but it's not the first question that needs to be addressed. The question we should be asking ourselves is this. Who do I need to become? You probably know some people who seem to do all the right things, but they still don't produce the results that they want, right? Why not? One thing Jim Rohn taught me is this. If you want to have more, you have to become more. 
Success is not something you pursue. What you pursue will elude you. It can be like trying to chase butterflies. Success is something you attract by the person you become. When I understood that philosophy, wow, it revolutionized my life and my personal growth. When I was single and ready to find my mate and get married, I made a long list of traits that I desired in the perfect woman for me. I filled more than 40 pages of a journal, front and back, describing her in great detail, her personality, character, key attributes, attitudes and philosophies about life, even what kind of family she'd come from, including her culture and physical makeup, down even to the texture of her hair. I wrote in depth what our life would be like and what we'd do together. If I then asked, okay, now what do I have to do to find and get this girl, I might still be on that butterfly chase right now. Instead, I looked back at the list and considered whether or not I embodied those same attributes myself. Did I have those very qualities I was expecting in her? I asked myself, what kind of man would a woman like this be looking for? Who do I need to become to be attractive to a woman of this substance? Then I filled 40 more pages describing all the attributes, qualities, behaviors, attitudes, and characteristics I needed to become myself. Then I went to work on becoming and achieving those qualities. And guess what? It worked. As if she were peeled off the pages of my journal and appeared in front of me. My wife, Georgia, is exactly what I described and asked for in almost eerie detail. The key was my getting clear on whom I'd have to be to attract and keep a woman of her quality and then doing the work to achieve that. Behave Yourself all right, let's map out your process for achieving the goals you've decided upon. This is the doing process, or in some cases, the stop doing process. What stands between you and your goal is your behavior. Do you need to stop doing anything so the compound effect isn't taking you in a downward spiral? Also, what do you need to start doing to change your trajectory so that you're headed in the most beneficial direction? In other words, what habits and behaviors do you need to subtract from and add to your life? Your life comes down to this formula. You, your choices, plus your behavior, plus your habits, compounded, equal your goal. That's why it's imperative to figure out which behaviors are blocking the path that leads you to your goal and which behaviors will help you accomplish the goal you desire. Now, you may think that you've got a handle on all your bad habits, but I'd bet good money you're wrong. Again, that's why tracking is so effective. I mean, honestly, do you know how many hours of TV you are really watching every day? How many hours do you spend tuned in to news channels or keeping up with the goals and accomplishments of others on the sports or style networks? Do you know how many cans of soda you drink or how many hours you spend doing non-essential work on the computer, Facebook? reading gossip online, etc. As I emphasized in the previous chapter, your first job is to become aware of how you're behaving. Where have you fallen asleep on the job and developed an unconscious bad habit that's leading you astray? Let me pause here and pass along a great tip shared with me by Brian Tracy. I'll read it to you just as he shared it with me. It's called the E versus E ratio, and it's the entertainment versus education ratio. What is your ratio. How many minutes do you spend each day on entertainment and how many minutes do you spend each day on education? He said the bottom 80% of people are preoccupied with entertainment, with iPods and music and radio and television and talking on their phone and reading the paper and surfing the internet and so on. But the top 20% are focused on education and getting better all the time. So any person anywhere in the world can go to the top if they just focus on getting better and just learning to try something new every single day and never stop improving. That is a great thing to evaluate. What is your entertainment versus education ratio? Give that some thought. I wrote an article on my blog recently that is called How to Change the World 
with a subtitle of This Article Could Change Your Life Experience Forever. No joke. Let me read just a bit of it to you. I think it's something you can use right now today. Here it is. I want to show you how to completely change the world in an instant. This might be a bit controversial for many and even more won't have the stomach to do what I'm suggesting. You can rid the world of all wars, crimes, scandals, gossip, corruption, and international conflict. You have that much power in the palm of your hand. Are you ready to change the world? If you dare, hit the off button. Turn off your TV, turn off your radio, turn off your newspaper subscription. I have explained before, and there's a video on my blog called Media Madness, how watching media that aggregates the most brutal, shocking, heinous, and scandalous events of the day can give you a perverted view of the world. And meanwhile, millions of beautiful, miraculous, positive, and wonderful things happen during the same day that don't get any attention. It's incredibly destructive to your spirit and creative potential. Here's the controversial part. Early on, I learned the difference between the world and my world. I, personally, only pay attention to my world. After all, it's the only thing I can do anything about. Paying too much attention to the rest of it only makes me feel fearful, frustrated, and cynical. All I have in life is my attention. And where our attention goes, energy flows, and so goes our life. I have to make the choice of where I want to give it. That choice affects my experience of life and determines my potential for positive creativity. I can focus on the worst of the world or the best. I can focus it on the things that I can't do anything about, or I can focus it on those things that I can and that have a direct impact on my life and the life of my family. Not long ago, a successful executive for whom I served on a nonprofit board hired me to mentor him on improving his productivity. He was already doing well, but knew he could optimize his time and output further with some coaching. I had him track his activities for a week and notice something I see all too often. He spent an incredible amount of time reviewing the news, 45 minutes in the morning reading the newspaper, another 30 minutes listening to news on his morning commute, and an equal amount of time tuning in again on his drive back home. During his workday, he checked Yahoo News several times, spending at least 20 minutes in total. When he got home, he'd catch the last 15 minutes of the local news while greeting his family. Then he'd catch up on 30 minutes of sports news and 30 minutes of the 10 o'clock news before going to bed. In total, he was spending three and a half hours with the news each day. This man wasn't an economist or a commodities trader or in any profession that lived or died by the latest news. The time he spent with the paper and news programs on radio and TV greatly exceeded what he needed to be a knowledgeable voter and a contributing member of society, or even to enhance his own personal interest. In fact, he was getting very little valuable information through his programming choices, or rather, his lack of choices. So why did he spend nearly four hours a day consuming it? It was a habit. So, I suggested that he keep his TV and radio off cancel his newspaper subscription, and set up an RSS feeder so he could select and review only the news he deemed important for his business and personal interests. Doing so immediately cleared out 95% of the mind-cluttering and time-sucking noise. He could now review all that mattered to him in less than 20 minutes a day. This left the 45 minutes in the morning, his commute time, and that hour in the evening for productive activities, exercise, listening to instructional and inspirational material, reading, planning, preparing, and spending quality time with his family. Now he tells me he's never felt less stressed and more inspired and focused than he does now. Constant negative news has a tendency to make you anxious. One small, simple change in habit, one giant leap forward in balance and productivity. Okay, now it's your turn. Get out your little notebook and write down your top three goals. Make a list of the bad habits that might be sabotaging your progress in each area. Write down every one. Habits and behaviors never lie. If there's a discrepancy between what you say and what you do, 
I'm going to believe what you do every time. If you tell me you want to be healthy, but you've got Dorito dust on your fingers, I'm believing the Doritos. If you say self-improvement is a priority, but you spend more time with your Xbox than at the library, I'm believing the Xbox. If you say you're a dedicated professional, but you show up late, unprepared, your behavior rats you out every time. You say your family is your top priority, but if they don't appear on your busy calendar, they aren't, really. Look at the list of bad habits you just made. That's the truth about who you are. Now you get to decide whether that's okay or if you want to change. And then next, add to that list all the habits that you need to adopt, that if practiced and compounded over time, will result in your gloriously achieving your goals. Making this list isn't about wasting energy by getting judgmental and regretful on yourself. It's about taking a clear-headed look at what you want to improve. I'm not going to leave you there, however. Let's uproot those sabotaging bad habits and plant new, positive, and healthy ones in their place. Game Changers. Five Strategies for Eliminating Bad Habits. Your habits are learned. Therefore, they can be unlearned. If you want to sail your life in a new direction, you have to first pick up the anchors of bad habits that have been weighing you down. The key is to make your why power so strong that it overwhelms your urges for instant gratification. And for that, you need a new game plan. The following are my all-time favorite game changers. One, identify your triggers. Look at your list of bad habits. For each one you've written down, identify what triggers it. Figure out what I call the big fours. The who, the what, the where, and the when underlying each bad behavior. For example, are you more likely to drink too much when you're around certain people? Is there a particular time of the day when you just have to have something sweet? What emotions tend to provoke your worst habits? Stress, fatigue, anger, nervousness, boredom? When do you experience those emotions? Who are you with? Where are you? And what are you doing? What situations prompt your bad habits to surface? Getting in your car, the time before performance reviews, visits with your in-laws, conferences, social settings, when you're feeling physically insecure or deadlines. Take a closer look at your routines. What do you typically do or say when you wake up? When you're on a coffee or a lunch break? When you've gotten home from a long day? Again, get out your notebook or use the Bad Habit Killer Worksheet, which you can download for free at thecompoundeffect.com forward slash free, and write down your triggers. This simple action alone increases your awareness exponentially. But of course, this isn't the whole enchilada, because as we've discussed, increasing your awareness of a bad habit isn't enough to break it. Number two, clean house. Get to scrubbing. And I mean this literally and figuratively. If you want to stop drinking alcohol, remove every drop of it from your house and your vacation house if you have one. Get rid of the glasses, any fancy utensils or doodads that you have when you drink. And those decorative olives too. If you want to stop drinking coffee, heave the coffee maker and give that bag of gourmet grounds to a sleepy neighbor. If you're trying to curb your spending, Take an evening and cancel every catalog or retail offer that flies through your mailbox or your inbox so you won't even need to muster the discipline to walk it from the front door to the recycling bin. If you want to eat more healthfully, clean your cupboards of all the crap and stop buying the junk food and stop buying into the argument that it's not fair to deny the other people in your family junk food just because you don't want it in your life. Trust me. Everyone in your family is better off without it. Don't bring it into the house, period. Get rid of whatever enables your bad habits. And three, swap it. Look again at your list of bad habits. How can you alter them so that they're not as harmful? Can you replace them with healthier habits or drop kick them all together, as in for good? Anyone who knows me knows that I love something sweet after a meal. 
If there is ice cream in the house, the something sweet turns into a triple scoop banana split with all the fixings. 1,255 calories. Instead, I replace that bad habit with two Hershey's Kisses, 50 calories. And I'm still able to satisfy the sweet tooth without having to spend the extra hour on the treadmill just to get back to even. My sister-in-law started a habit of eating crunchy and salty junk food when she watched TV. She crunched through a whole bag of tortilla chips with little actual awareness. Then she realized that what she really enjoyed was just the crunchy sensation in her mouth. So she decided to replace her bad habit with crunching on carrot and celery sticks and raw broccoli spears. She got the same joyful sensation and her FDA recommended vegetable servings at the same time. A guy who used to work for me had a habit of drinking 8 to 10 Diet Cokes a day. That is a bad habit. I suggested that he replace them with low-sodium carbonated water, adding fresh lemon, lime, or oranges. He did this for about a month before realizing he didn't need the carbonation at all and switched to just plain water. So play with this and see what behaviors you can replace, delete, or swap out. Number four is ease in. I live near the Pacific Ocean. Whenever I get into the water, I get my ankles acclimated first. Then I walk in up to my knees, and then it's my waist and chest before taking the plunge. Some people just run and dive in and get it over with. Good for them. Not me. I like to ease my way in. This is probably residual trauma from my childhood, as you'll see in the next strategy. For some of your long-standing and deep-rooted habits, it might be more effective to take small steps to ease into unwinding them. You may have spent decades repeating, cementing, and fortifying those habits, so it can be wise to give yourself some time to unravel them, one step at a time. A few years ago, my wife's doctor required that she cut caffeine from her diet for several months. We both love our coffee. So if she was going to have to suffer, I decided it was only fair that we do it together. We first went to 50-50, 50% decaffeinated and 50% regular for a week. Then 100% decaf for another week. Then Earl Grey decaf tea for a week, followed by decaf green tea. It took us about a month to get there, but we didn't suffer even one moment of caffeine withdrawal. No headaches, no sleepiness, no brain fog, no nothing. However, if we had gone cold turkey, well, I shiver at the thought. And number five, jump in. Now, not everyone is wired the same way. Some researchers have found that it can be paradoxically easier for people to make lifestyle changes if they change a great many bad habits all at once. For example, pioneering cardiologist Dr. Dean Ornish found he could reverse people's advanced heart disease without medication or surgery with dramatic lifestyle changes. He discovered they often found it easier to say goodbye to almost all of their bad habits all at once. He enrolled them in a training session where he substituted a very low-fat diet for their fat and cholesterol-rich fare. The program included exercise, getting them off their couches and walking or jogging, as well as stress reduction techniques and other heart-healthy habits. Amazingly, in less than a month, these patients learned to let go of a lifetime of bad habits and embrace new ones, and they went on to experience dramatic health benefits after a year as a result. Personally, I find this to be the exception and not the rule, but you'll have to figure out the strategy that works best for you. When I was a kid, my family camped at a little known spot called Lake Rollins. The lake, situated not far from the Sierras in Northern California, is fed from glaciers that melt from atop the mountains of Lake Tahoe. The water is ridiculously cold. Every day we were there, my dad insisted that I water ski in this polar pond. All day I would be quietly anxious about the dreaded call to go in. Now. I loved the water ski. I just hated getting in the water. A slight conflict of interest, I know. Because, of course, there was no separating one from the other. Dad made sure I never missed my turn, sometimes by actually physically throwing me in. After a dozen or so excruciating seconds of near hyperthermia, I always found the water to be 
refreshing and rejuvenating. My anticipation of getting in the water was actually worse than the reality of just jumping in. Once my body acclimated, water skiing was a blast. And yet, I went through this cycle of dread and relief each and every time. That experience isn't unlike that of suddenly dropping or changing a bad habit. For a short while, it can feel excruciating or at least quite uncomfortable. But just as the body adjusts to a changing environment through a process called homeostasis, we have a similar homeostatic ability to adjust to unfamiliar behavior changes. And usually, we can regulate ourselves physiologically and psychologically to the new circumstances quite quickly. So, sometimes wading in just won't do. Sometimes you really do have to just jump in. I want you to ask yourself now, where can I start slow and hold myself accountable? And where do I need to just take the big leap? Where have I been avoiding pain or discomfort when I know deep down that I'll adapt in no time if I just go for it? One of my former partners had a brother who was a beer-guzzling, bar-brawling, life-of-the-party alcoholic. He drank at lunch, with dinner, after dinner, and all weekend long. One day he was at a wedding for a former college roommate when he saw his friend's brother who was 10 years older than both of them but looked 10 years younger. He watched the man dance, laugh, and play during the wedding, exuding a vitality he hadn't felt himself in many years. He made a decision on the spot that he would never touch another drop of alcohol again. Cold turkey, that was it. Never again. And he hasn't in more than six years. When it comes to changing bad habits at home, I'm a toe dipper. But in my professional life, I find that taking the big plunge is far more effective. Whether it's committing to a new business or dealing with potential new clients, partners, or investors, toe dipping usually doesn't cut it. Each time I think of the Lake Rollins experience and know that it will be painful at first, but I remember that within a little time it will be exhilarating and well worth the temporary discomfort. Run a vice check. I'm not suggesting you cut out every bad thing in your life. Most everything is good in moderation. But how can you tell whether a bad habit is becoming the boss of you? I believe in testing my vices. Every so often, I go on what's called a vice fast. I pick one vice and check to be sure that I'm still the alpha dog in our relationship. My vices are coffee, ice cream, wine, and movies. I already told you about my ice cream obsession. When it comes to wine... I want to be sure that I'm enjoying a glass of wine and celebrating the day, not drowning a bad mood. About every three months, I pick one vice and abstain for 30 days. This probably stems from my Catholic Lent upbringing. I love proving to myself that I'm still in charge. Try this yourself. Pick a vice, something you do in moderation, but you know it doesn't contribute to your highest good. And take yourself on a 30-day wagon run. If you find it seriously difficult to abstain for those 30 days, you may have found a habit worth cutting out of your life completely. Game Changers. Seven techniques for installing good habits. Now that we've helped you eliminate the bad habits that are taking you in the wrong direction, we need to create the choices, behaviors, and ultimately habits that will finally take you in the direction of your grandest desires. Eliminating a bad habit means removing something from your routine. Installing a new, more productive habit requires an entirely different skill set. You're planting the tree, watering it, fertilizing it, and making sure it's properly rooted. Doing so takes effort, time, and practice. Here are my favorite techniques for putting good habits in place. Leadership expert John C. Maxwell said, you will never change your life until you change something you do daily. The secret of your success is found in your daily routine. According to research, it takes about 300 instances of positive reinforcement to turn a new habit into an unconscious practice. That's almost a year of daily practice. Fortunately, as we talked about earlier, we've got a much better chance of cementing a new habit into our lives after three weeks of diligent focus. That means if we bring special attention to a new habit daily 
for the first three weeks, we have a far better chance of making it into a lifelong practice. The truth is, you can change a habit in a second, or you could still be trying to break it after 10 long years. I bet the first time that you touched the hot stove, you instantly knew you never wanted to make that a habit. The shock and the pain was so intense that it forever changed your awareness. You knew you'd be conscious for the rest of your life around hot stoves. The key is staying aware. If you really want to maintain a good habit, make sure you pay attention to it at least once a day, and you're far more likely to succeed. Game changer number one, set yourself up to succeed. Any new habit has to work inside your life and lifestyle. If you join a gym that's 30 miles away, you won't go. If you're a night owl, but the gym closes at 6 p.m., it's not going to work for you. Your gym must be close, convenient, and fit into your schedule. If you want to lose weight and eat healthier, make sure your fridge and pantry are stocked with healthy options. Want to make sure you don't binge on vending machine snacks when you get your midday hunger pangs? Keep nuts and healthy snacks in your desk drawer. The easiest thing to grab when you're hungry is empty carbs. One of the strategies I use is to have protein on hand and convenient at all times. So what I do is I cook up a bunch of chicken on Sunday, package it up, and have it ready throughout the week. Now, I guess as part confessional, one of my most distracting and destructive habits is my email addiction. Seriously, this is no laughing matter. I could lose hours of focus every day with the massive amounts of email flooding my inbox if I'm not vigilant about staying organized and focused. To set up the discipline of my new habit of only checking email three times a day, here's what I did. I turned off all alarms, all automatic receive functions, and shut the program down whenever I'm not in one of those three windows of allocated time. I have to build walls around that time vortex lest I keep falling in all day long. When I asked Donald Trump what was one of his competitive advantages, this is what he said. I work efficiently, which requires focus. Many people underestimate the power of focus, and it's something I observe, and I can tell who has it and who doesn't. Well, it appears to have worked for the Donald. He seems to be getting a lot more done than you and I. So I challenge you with what I'm constantly challenging myself. Are you staying focused on your most important priorities, those few key habits that could dramatically improve your efficiency, productive output, and quality life experience rather than getting bogged down in life's unessentials. Game changer number two. Think addition, not subtraction. When I interviewed Montel Williams for success, he told me about the strict diet he maintains because of the disease that afflicts him, multiple sclerosis. Montel has adopted something called the add-in principle, and I think it's a wildly effective tool for anyone with a goal. He said, it's not so much what you attempt to take out of your diet, it's what you put in instead. This has become his analogy for life. Instead of thinking he has to deprive himself or take something out of his diet, example, I can't eat a hamburger, chocolate, or dairy, he thinks about what he can have instead Today I'm going to have a salad and steamed vegetables and fresh figs. He fills his focus and his belly with what he can have so he no longer has attention or hunger for what he can't. Instead of focusing on what he has to sacrifice, Montel thinks about what he gets to add in. The result is a lot more powerful. A friend of mine wanted to break his bad habit of wasting too much time watching TV. To help out, I asked him what he'd like to do with the three hours of free time if he had it. He said he would play with his kids more. I asked him to pick a hobby he'd also want to explore. His choice was photography. A total techie, he went all out and got all the high-tech editing equipment, which he happily toted around on more family outings so he could take great photos of his kids. Then he spent hours in the evening editing and putting together slideshows and photo albums for the whole family to enjoy. They ended up spending time together, laughing, and remembering how much fun they'd had. Because he was so focused on his kids and photography, he no longer had the time nor the desire to sit around and watch TV at night. He realized he had been zoning out on it because it was an easy mental escape from his workday. By replacing TV viewing with his new habit of playing games with his kids, 
and working on his photography hobby, he discovered passions with far more power and far bigger payoffs. So what can you choose to add in so you can enrich your life experience? Game changer number three, go for a PDA, public display of accountability. Picture any public official taking the oath of office. They say, I do solemnly swear. Then comes the speech on how she'll turn her campaign promises into boots-on-the-ground realities. Once she puts it out there, on public record, she knows that she'll be held responsible for any action that she rolls back on her promises and praised for any progress towards her goals. So, do you want to cement that new habit? Get Big Brother to watch you. And it's never been easier with all the social media out there and available. I heard about one woman who decided to get control of her finances by blogging about every penny she spends every day. She got her family, friends, and plenty of colleagues following her spending habits, and as a result of the many eyes of scrutiny, she became far more responsible and disciplined in her finances. I once helped a co-worker quit smoking by telling everyone at the company, Listen up. Zelda's decided to stop smoking. Isn't that great? She just smoked her last cigarette. And then I placed a big, huge wall calendar on the outside of her cubicle. Every day she didn't smoke, Zelda got to draw a big, fat red X on the calendar. Co-workers took notice and started to cheer her on, and the parade of big red X's started to fill up the chart, which took on a life of its own. Zelda didn't want to quit on that chart, quit on her co-workers, or quit on herself. But she did quit smoking. Tell your family, tell your friends, tell Facebook, tell Twitter. Get the word out that there's a new sheriff in town and you're in charge. Game changer number four. Find a success buddy. There are few things as powerful as two people locked arm in arm marching towards the same goal. To up your chances of success, get a success buddy. Someone who will keep you accountable as you cement your new habit while you return the favor. For example, I have what I call a peak performance partner. Every Friday at 11 a.m. sharp, we have a 30-minute call during which we trade our wins, losses, fixes, ahas, and solicit the needed feedback and hold each other accountable. You might seek out a success buddy for regular walks, runs, or dates at the gym, or just to meet to discuss and trade personal development books. Game changer number five, competition and camaraderie. There's nothing like a friendly contest to wet your competitive spirit and immerse yourself in a new habit with a bang. Dr. Mehmet Oz once told me in an interview, if people would just walk a thousand more steps per day, they would change their lives. Video Plus, the parent company for success, held a step competition using shoe pedometers to count steps. Employees organized themselves into teams and competed to see which team would accumulate the most steps. It was amazing to me that people who didn't previously exercise for their own health or benefit suddenly started walking four, five, or six miles a day. At lunch, they walked the parking lot. If they knew they had a conference call, suddenly they were out doing it on their cell phones while they walked. Because of the competition, they found ways to increase their activity. Everyone's steps were tracked, and the whole office could see who was slacking off and who was stepping up. People's step tallies increased every day. Yet, as soon as the competition was over, I was fascinated to observe that the step count completely dropped off the cliff by more than 60% in just one month after the competition. When the competition was reorganized again, the step count shot right back up. All it took was a little competition to keep people's engines revved, and they got a wonderful sense of community and shared experience and camaraderie in the bargain. Oh, let me add in another idea that I've seen to work especially well. My wife, Georgia, was never a runner. She's one of these women that other women hate because she stays in pretty great shape without having to do much. But she made friends with a client of her interior design business who was a runner. She went to cheer her on at the finish of a half marathon once, which was only a few months after her client, Michelle, had delivered a baby. Quite impressive by anyone's standards. At that event, Georgia got inspired to run a half marathon herself.
She started training and did pretty well for a while, and then something happened with her registration for the upcoming event, and she stopped running entirely. Encouraged once again by her friend, she decided to register for one that would be only a few days before her 40th birthday. But this time, someone recommended the Nike Plus iPod sensor that builds a running training regimen and tracks her progress. I am super proud of her. She has been steadfast in keeping up with her training schedule. And one reason, in my observation, is because the system makes tracking and accountability easy and very visually evident. And she can compare her progress with her friends, which is a big part of keeping her motivation going and keeping her on track with her accountability. Not only does she know if she's keeping up with them, but now all her friends know and monitor her progress as well. So, as you look to incorporate new disciplines and habits into your lifestyle, look for ways to infuse some tracking and accountability measurement systems along the way with some friendly competition. Think about it. What can you organize with your friends, colleagues, or teammates? How can you inject fun rivalry and a competitive spirit into your new habit? Game changer number six. Celebrate. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, and it's a recipe for backsliding. There should be a time to celebrate, to enjoy some of the fruits of your victories along the way. You can't go through this thing sacrificing yourself with no benefit. You've got to find little rewards to give yourself every month, every week, every day. Even if it's something small to acknowledge that you've held yourself to a new behavior. Maybe it's just time to yourself to take a walk. Relax in the bath or read something just for fun. For bigger milestones, book a massage or have dinner at your favorite restaurant and promise yourself a nice big pot of gold when you reach the end of the rainbow. Change is hard. Yippee! There is one thing that 99% of failures and successful folks have in common. They all hate doing the same things. The difference is successful people do them anyway. Change is hard. That's why people don't transform their bad habits and why so many people end up unhappy and unhealthy. What excites me about this reality, however, is that if change were easy and everyone were doing it, it would be much more difficult for you and me to stand out and become an extraordinary success. Hey, ordinary is easy. Extraordinary is what will separate you from the crowd. Personally, I'm always happy when something is hard. Why, you ask? Because I know that most people won't do what it takes. Therefore, it will be easier for me to step in front of the pack and take the lead. I love what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said so eloquently. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in the moment of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at the times of challenge. When you press on despite difficulty, tedium, and hardship, that's when you earn your improvement and gain strides on the competition. If it's hard, awkward, tedious, so be it. Just do it. And keep doing it. And the magic of the compound effect will reward you handsomely. Be patient. When it comes to breaking old bad habits and starting new ones, Remember to be patient with yourself. You've spent 20, 30, or 40 years or more repeating the bad behaviors you're trying to change. You've got to expect it's going to take some time and some effort before you see lasting results. Science shows that the patterns of thoughts and actions repeated many times create what's called a neurosignature or brain groove or a series of interconnected neurons that carry the thought patterns of a particular habit. Attention feeds the habit. When we give our attention to a habit, we activate the brain groove, releasing the thoughts, desires, and actions related to that habit. Luckily, our brains are malleable. If we stop giving attention to the bad habits, those grooves weaken. When we form new habits, we drive new grooves deeper with each repetition, eventually overpowering the previous ones. Creating new habits and burning new grooves into your brain will take time. Be patient with yourself. If you fall off the wagon, brush yourself off, not beat yourself up, and get back on. No problem. Hey, we all stumble. Just go again and try another strategy. 
Reinforce your commitment and consistency. When you press on, you will receive huge payoffs. And speaking of payoffs, the next chapter is where we really start breaking away from the herd, where the multiplying effect really takes shape. With all the disciplined effort you've applied from the fundamentals of the first three chapters, here's where you get rewarded, big time. Oh, and before we move to chapter four, let me remind you again to go back to the book and review the summary action steps. I've taken the knowledge from the entire chapter we just covered and reduced it to a half a dozen action steps to be sure that you're transferring what you're learning into actual results in your life. Chapter Four: Momentum. I'd like to introduce you to a very good friend of mine. This friend, also close to Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Richard Branson, Michael Jordan, Lance Armstrong, Michael Phelps, and every other super achiever, will impact your life like no other. I'd like to introduce you to Mo, or Big Mo, as I like to call it. Big Mo. Without a doubt, is one of the most powerful and enigmatic forces of success. You can't see or feel Mo, but you know when you've got it. You can't count on Mo showing up to every occasion, but when it does, wow! Big Mo can catapult you into the stratosphere of success. And once you've got Mo on your side, there's almost no way anyone can catch you. I'm excited about this chapter. When you implement the ideas outlined ahead, your payoff will be a thousand times or more what you paid for this book. Seriously, these ideas are big. Harnessing the power of Big Mo. If you remember your high school physics class, you do, don't you? You'll recall Newton's first law, also known as the law of inertia. Objects at rest. Tend to stay at rest unless acted on by an outside force. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion unless something stops their momentum. Put another way, couch potatoes tend to stay couch potatoes. Achievers, people who get into a successful rhythm, continue busting their butts and end up achieving more and more. It's not easy to build momentum, but once you do, look out. Do you remember playing on the merry-go-round when you were a kid? A bunch of your friends piled on, weighing the thing down, and then chanted as you worked to get the thing moving. Getting started was slow going. The first step was always the hardest: getting it to move from a standstill. You had to push and pull, grimace and groan, and throw your entire body into the effort. One step, two steps, three steps. It seemed like you were getting nowhere. After a long and hard effort. Finally, you were able to get up a little bit of speed and start running alongside it. Even though you were moving and your friends were cheering louder, to get the speed you really wanted, you had to keep running faster and faster, pulling it behind you as you ran with all your might. Finally, success! You jumped on and joined your friends in the joy of feeling the wind in your face and watching the outside world turn into a smear of colors. After a while, when the merry-go-round started to slow down, you'd hop off and run alongside for a minute, get the speed back up, or you could simply give it a couple of good pushes and then hop back on. Once the merry-go-round was spinning at a good clip, momentum took over, making it easy to keep it going. Adopting any change is the same way. You get started by taking one small step, one action at a time. Progress is slow. But once a newly formed habit has kicked in, Big Mo joins the party. Your success and results compound rapidly. The same thing happens when a rocket ship launches. The space shuttle uses more fuel during the first few minutes of flight than it does the entire rest of the trip. Why is that? Because it has to break free of the pull of gravity. Once it does, it can glide into orbit. So for you, what's the hard part? Getting off the ground. Your old ways and your old conditioning are just like the inertia of the merry-go-round or the pull of gravity. Everything just wants to stay at rest or stay the same. You'll need a lot of energy to break your inertia and get your new enterprise underway. But once you get momentum, you will be hard to stop, virtually unbeatable, 
even though you're now just putting out considerably less effort while receiving greater results. Have you ever wondered why successful people tend to get more successful? The rich get richer, the happy get happier, and the lucky get luckier. They've got Mo. When it rains, it pours. But momentum can work on both sides of the equation. It can work for you or against you. Since the compound effect is always working, negative habits, when left unchecked, can build up steam and send you into a tailspin of quote unquote unlucky circumstances and consequences. That's what our friend Brad from Chapter One experienced. He gained 33 pounds with a few small bad habits and experienced major job and marriage stress because of the negative momentum those habits generated. The law of inertia says objects at rest tend to stay at rest. That's the compound effect working against you. The more time you spend on that couch watching Two and a Half Men, the harder it will be for you to get up and get moving. So let's start right now. How do you get Big Mo to pay you a visit? You build up to it. You get in the groove, the zone, by doing things we've covered so far. One, making new choices based on your goals and core values. Two, putting those choices to work through positive behaviors. Three. Repeating those healthy actions long enough to establish new habits. Four, building routines and rhythms into your daily disciplines. Five, staying consistent over a long enough period of time. Then, bang, Big Mo kicks in your door, and that's a good thing. And you're virtually unstoppable. Think about swimmer Michael Phelps, who won a legendary eight gold medals at the 2008 Summer Olympics in Beijing. How did he do it? Working with his coach Bob Bowman, Phelps honed his talents over the course of 12 years. Together, they built routines and rhythms, and developed a consistency of performance that prepared Phelps to catch momentum just at the right time: the Olympic Games. Phelps and Bowman's symbiotic relationship is legendary for its scope and ambition, and its utter predictability. Bowman required such consistency when it came to practice that one of Phelps' most vivid memories is when Bowman allowed him to finish a training session 15 minutes early so he could get ready for a middle school dance. That's one time in 12 years. No wonder Phelps was so unbeatable in the pool. Chances are you have an iPod. Ever think about the evolution that made it possible for that little gizmo to wind up in your pocket? Apple was around a long time before they launched the iPod. While Mac computers have always had an intensely loyal following, they still comprise only a small fraction of the overall PC market. The iPod certainly wasn't the first MP3 player out there. Actually, Apple was late to the game, but they had something powerful going for them: the consistency of their efforts in maintaining customer loyalty, a steadfast commitment to high quality. Innovative design and ease of use. They made the MP3 player simple, cool, easy to use, and to play with, and promoted it through entertaining and inventive ad campaigns. It worked. It hit a nerve. But the iPod wasn't an overnight success, like a lot of people assume. In 2001, the year Apple released the iPod, they went from 30% revenue growth the year previous. To negative 33 percent. The following year, 2002, was also a negative revenue growth at negative 2 percent. But 2003, they saw a slight shift to the positive with 18 percent. Growth came again in 2004, up 33 percent, and in 2005, they caught Mo and bang, Apple catapulted to 68 percent revenue growth. And now holds more than 70% of the MP3 player market share. As you know, Big Mo has since helped them dominate the smartphone market with the iPhone and the digital music distribution market with iTunes. This momentum has also given them a resurgence of growth in their original market of personal computers. With Big Mo on their side, I wouldn't be surprised to see them expand into other markets. Google. Was a small struggling search engine for a long while. Today, it too owns more than 60% of its market. 
YouTube, the video sharing space created in February of 2005, officially launched in November of that year. But it wasn't until they featured the Lazy Sunday digital short that originally aired on Saturday Night Live that people started going to YouTube in huge numbers to find it. That YouTube video clip went viral. It got more than 5 million views before NBC asked to have it taken down. Then there was no way to catch him. They had Mo. Today, YouTube owns more than 60% of the video market. Google caught up with YouTube and the two young founders and paid them $1.65 billion to buy their Mo. Wow. So, what do Michael Phelps, Apple, Google, and YouTube have in common? They were doing the same things before and after they achieved momentum. Their habits, disciplines, routines, and their consistency were the keys that unlocked momentum for each. And they became unstoppable when Big Mo showed up to their party. Routine power. Some of our best intentions fail because we don't have a system of execution. When it comes down to it, your new attitudes and behaviors must be incorporated into your monthly, weekly, and daily routines to affect any real and positive change. A routine is something you do every day, without fail, so that eventually, like brushing your teeth or putting on your seatbelt, you do it without conscious thought. Similar to our discussion in the habits section, if you look at anything that you do successfully, you'll see that you've probably developed a routine for it. These routines ease life stresses by making our actions automatic and effective. To reach new goals and develop new habits, it's necessary to create new routines to support your objectives. The greater the challenge, the more rigorous our routines need to be. Ever wonder why they make military boot camp so hard? Where relatively minor tasks like making the bed, shining your shoes, or standing at attention become over-the-top important? Building routines to prep soldiers for combat is the most effective way to elicit efficient, productive, and reliable performance under intense pressure. The seemingly simplistic routines built and developed during basic training are so exact that soft, fearful, slovenly teenagers are transformed into lean, confident, mission-driven soldiers in only 8 to 12 weeks. Their routines are so well rehearsed that these young soldiers can instinctively act with precision in the middle of the chaos of combat. That intense level of training and practice prepares soldiers to carry out their duties, even under the threat of imminent death. Now, your days might not be as dangerous, but without the proper routines built into your schedule, the results of your life can be unruly and unnecessarily hard. Developing a routine of predictable, daily disciplines prepares you to be victorious on the battlefield of life. Golfer Jack Nicklaus was famous for his pre-shot routine. He was religious about the dance that he would do before every shot, a series of routine mental and physical steps that got him fully focused and ready for each shot. Jack would start out behind the ball, then pick out one or two intermediate spots between the ball and the target. As he walked around and approached the ball, the first thing that he would do is line his club face up with the intermediate target. He wouldn't put his feet into position until he felt that he had his club face properly squared up. Then he would take his stance. From there, he would waggle the club, look out to his ultimate target, then back to his intermediate target and back to the golf club, and repeat that view a couple of times. Then, and only then, would he strike the ball. During one of the important majors, a psychologist timed Nicholas from the moment he pulled the club out of the bag until the moment he hit the ball. Guess what? Each shot... From the first tee to the 18th green, the timing of Jack's routine supposedly never varied more than one second. That is amazing. The same psychologist measured Greg Norman during his unfortunate collapse at the 1996 Masters. Lo and behold, his pre-shot routine got faster and faster as the round progressed. Varying his routine stunted his rhythm and consistency, and he was never able to catch momentum. The moment Norman changed his routine, his performance became unpredictable and his results erratic. Football kickers likewise cherish their pre-kick routines. 
which allow them to get into sync with the thousands of times they have done the same action. Without a pre-kick routine, their performance under game time pressure greatly diminishes. Pilots go through their pre-flight checklist. Even when a pilot has logged thousands of hours and the plane just came in from a perfect performance review from a previous destination, the pilot goes through a pre-flight checklist every time without fail. This not only prepares the plane, but more importantly, centers the pilot and prepares him or her for the upcoming performance. Of all the high achievers and business owners I've worked with, I've seen that along with good habits, each has developed routines for accomplishing necessary daily disciplines. It's the only way any of us can predictably regulate our behavior. There simply isn't any way around it. A daily routine built on good habits and disciplines separates the most successful amongst us from everyone else. A routine is exceptionally powerful. To create powerful and effective routines, you must first decide what behaviors and habits you want to implement. Take a moment to review your goals from Chapter 3, as well as the behaviors you want to add and subtract. Now it's your turn to be Jack Nicklaus and figure out your best pre-shot routine. Be intentional about what components belong. Once you establish, say, a morning routine, I want you to consider it cast in concrete until further notice. You get up, you do it, no argument. If someone or something interrupts you, start back at the beginning to anchor your foundation for the performance that follows. Bookend your days. The key to becoming world-class in your endeavors is to build your performance around world-class routines. It can be difficult, even futile, to predict or control what will show up in the middle of your workday, but you can always control how your day starts and ends. I have routines for both. I'll share aspects of each here to give you some ideas and to help you better understand the power and importance of building your new behaviors into disciplined routines. Starting with my goals in mind, I design my behaviors and routines accordingly. Perhaps in sharing some of what works for me, you'll identify strategies you'd like to try. Rise and shine. My morning routine is my Jack Nicklaus pre-shot preparation. It sets me up for the entire day. Because it happens every morning, it's locked in and I don't have to think about it. My iPhone alarm goes off at 5 a.m. Well, confession, sometimes 5.30 a.m. And I hit the snooze button. Then I know I have eight minutes. Why eight? I have no idea. Ask Steve Jobs. He programmed it. During those eight minutes, I do three things. First, I think of all the things that I'm grateful for. I know that I need to attune my mind to abundance. The world looks, acts, and responds to you very differently when you start your day with a feeling and orientation of gratitude for that which you already have. Second, I do something that sounds a bit odd. I send love to someone. The way to get love is to give love. And the one thing I want more of is love. I give love by thinking of one person, anyone. It could be a friend, a relative, a coworker, or even just somebody I met in the supermarket. It really doesn't matter. And then I send love to them by imagining all the things that I wish and hope for them. Some would call this a blessing or a prayer. I call it a mental love letter. Third, I think about my number one goal and decide which three things I'm going to do on this day to move closer to reaching it. For example, at the time of this recording, my number one goal is to deepen the love and intimacy in my marriage. So each morning I plan out three things that I can do to make sure that my wife feels loved, respected, and beautiful. Now when I get up, I put on a pot of coffee, and while it's brewing, I do a series of stretches for about 10 minutes. This is something I picked up from Dr. Oz. If you've lifted weights your whole life as I have, you get stiff. I realized that the only way I was going to incorporate more stretching into my life was to make it a routine. I had to figure out where in my schedule I could possibly fit this in. And while the coffee is brewing is as good a time as any. Once I finish my stretches and pour my cup of joe, I sit down in my comfy leather recliner. Set my iPhone for 30 minutes, no more, no less, and read something positive and instructional. 
When the alarm sounds, I take my most important project and work on it for an hour of completely focused and undistracted effort. Notice that I haven't opened up my email yet. Then every morning at 7 a.m., I have what I call my calibration appointment, a reoccurring appointment set in my calendar, where I take 15 minutes to calibrate my day. This is where I brush over my top three one-year and five-year goals, my key quarterly objectives, and my top goal for the week and month. Then, here's the most important part of the calibration appointment. I review or set my top three MVPs, that is, most valuable priorities for that day. I ask myself, if I only did three things today, what are the actions that will produce the greatest results moving me closer to my big goals? Then and only then do I open up email and send out a flurry of tasks and delegations to get the rest of my team started on their day. And then I quickly close down my email and go to work on my MVPs. Now, the rest of the day can take on a million different shapes. But as long as I go through my morning routine, a majority of my key disciplines that I need to be practicing are already taken care of. And I'm already properly grounded and prepared to perform at a much higher level than if I started out each day erratically, or worse, with a set of bad habits. Sweet dreams. In the evening, I like to do what's called cash out something I learned from waiting tables in my youth. Before we could go home, we had to cash out, meaning turn in all our receipts, credit card slips, and the cash. Everything had to add up or there was big trouble. It, too, is important to cash out your day's performance. Compared to your plan for the day, how did it go? What do you need to carry over to tomorrow's plan? What else needs to be added based on what showed up throughout the day? What's no longer important and needs to be scratched out? Additionally, I like to log in my journal any new ideas, ahas, or insights that I picked up throughout the day. This is how I've collected more than 40 journals of incredible ideas, insights, and strategies. Finally, I like to read at least 10 pages of an inspirational book before I go to sleep. I know the mind continues to process the last information consumed before bedtime. So I want to focus my attention on something constructive and helpful and making progress with my goals and ambitions. So, that's it. All hell could break loose throughout the day. But because I control the bookends, I know I'm always going to start and finish strong. Shake it up. Every so often, I like to interrupt my routines. Otherwise, life gets stale and I plateau. An easy example is working out with weights. When I work out the same way, at the same time, doing the same repetitive movements week after week, my body stops showing the compounded results. I get bored, lose my passion, and Big Mo is a no-show. That's why it's important to mix it up. Challenge yourself in new ways and freshen up your experience. Right now I'm working on adding more adventure into my life. I set weekly, monthly, and yearly goals to do something I wouldn't normally do. Now, most of the time, it's nothing earth-shattering, but things such as eating different kinds of food, taking a class, visiting a new destination, or joining a club to meet new people. This change of pace makes me feel alive, helps recapture my passion, and offers me opportunities for fresh perspectives. So, look at your routines. If something that used to energize you has become the same old, same old, or is no longer generating powerful results, switch it up. Getting into a rhythm, finding your new groove. Once your daily disciplines have become a routine, you want the succession of those steps to create a rhythm. When your disciplines and actions jive into a regular weekly, monthly, quarterly, and yearly rhythm, it's like laying a big welcome mat at the front door for Big Mo. Here's an analogy. It's like the big giant wheels of a steam locomotive. At a standstill, it takes very little to keep it from moving forward. A one-inch block of wood placed under the front wheel will do the job. It takes an incredible amount of steam to get the pistons to move that cause a series of connections to get the big giant wheels to just budge. It's a slow process, but once the train starts rolling, the wheels get into a rhythm. 
If the pressure remains consistent, the train gains momentum. And then, watch out. At 55 miles an hour, that same train can crash through a 5-foot steel-reinforced concrete wall and keep on going. Envisioning your success as an unstoppable locomotive may help you stay enthusiastic about getting into your rhythm. Along with my daily rhythms, I also plan ahead. For instance, in looking again at my goal of deepening the love and intimacy of my marriage, I designed a weekly, monthly, and quarterly rhythm schedule. I know it doesn't sound too romantic, but maybe you've noticed even when something's a high priority for you, if it isn't scheduled on your calendar, it often doesn't happen, right? Certainly not with the regularity you'll need to get into any kind of rhythm. So here's how it works. Every Friday night is date night, and Georgia and I go out or do something special together. At 6 p.m., an alarm goes off on both our iPhones, and no matter what we're doing, date night is on. Every Saturday is FD, family day, which means no working. Essentially, sundown on Friday night until sunup on Sunday morning is time we devote to the marriage and family. If you don't create these boundaries, one day has a tendency to flow into the next. Unfortunately, the people who get shoved aside are often the most important. Now, every Sunday night, also at 6 p.m., we have our RR, Relationship Review. This is a practice I picked up from relationship experts Linda and Richard Iyer. During this time, we discuss the previous week's wins, losses, as well as the adjustments we need to make in our relationship. We start the conversation by telling each other a few things we appreciate about the other during the previous week. It's helpful to start off with the good stuff. Then, using an idea I picked up from my interview with Jack Canfield, we ask each other, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the best, how would you rate our relationship this week? This really gets the discussion of wins and losses flowing. Oh boy! Then we discuss the adjustments that need to be made through this follow-up question. What would it take to make the experience a 10? By the end of the discussion, both of us feel heard and validated, and we've made our observations and wishes clear moving into the next week. This is an incredible process. I highly recommend it, if you dare. Now, every month, Georgia and I schedule something unique and memorable. Jim Rohn taught me this. Life is simply a collection of experiences. Our goal should be to increase the frequency and intensity of good experiences. Once a month, we try to do something that creates an experience that has some memorable intensity. It could be driving up to the mountains or going on an adventurous hike or driving up to L.A. to try a new fancy restaurant out or going sailing in the bay, whatever. Something out of the ordinary that has a heightened experience and creates an indelible memory. And once a quarter, we plan a two or three day getaway. I like to do a quarterly review of all my goals and life patterns. And this is a great time to do a deeper check in on how things are going in our relationship. Then we have our special travel vacation, plus our holiday traditions and our New Year's hike and goal setting ritual. You can see that once all of this is scheduled, you no longer have to think about what you need to be doing. Everything happens naturally. We've created a rhythm that gives us momentum. Allow me to jump off the script again here and share something Harvey McKay told me about marriage. He said, I learned the day I got married that anyone can fall in love. It takes no talent whatsoever to fall in love. But to remain in love is a real challenge. And you have to make that priority one, two, and three in your life. On the topic of creating a great marriage, one of the great models for my life was my mentor Paul J. Meyer and his wife Jane. The best way to explain this is a letter I received not too long ago from a man named David in Buckley, Washington. David wrote how he had been at a friend's house and was asked to make a beer run, but his car was blocked in so he borrowed a friend's car. When he got in the car, the success CD was playing with the interview between Paul J. Meyer and me back from our June issue of 2008. He thought it was the radio, so we just let it play. In the interview, I was asking Paul how he's kept such an amazing magic in his marriage of 37 years. Paul was explaining how he has sent Jane flowers every week for 37 years, 
and how he purposefully and intentionally has treated her the same every day as he did during courtship. He never stopped courting her. Every day of their marriage, Paul said he found reasons to tell her he loved her at least ten times. Every day. I knew Paul and Jane personally, and I can attest to this. While Dave was driving, listening to this interview, for some reason, at that time, in that moment, those words penetrated Dave's heart. That evening, he sat down with his wife and said, I realized I've been wrapped up in myself, not giving you the attention, respect, reverence, and love you deserve. I'd like to renew my commitment to you tonight, to be the man I promised to be when we first got married. I love you, Katie. I always have. But now I promise to tell you and show you every day. Dave wrote that his wife Katie burst into tears and couldn't speak for several minutes. When she finally calmed down, she said, I have been living with a broken heart for many months now. I didn't think you loved me anymore, and the pain became too much. Two days earlier, I met with an attorney to file for divorce. I was planning to tell you tomorrow morning. Dave said, That CD saved my marriage. It saved my life. Paul Meyer's example showed me how I could be in my marriage. The past year has been the best of my life. We've never been more in love and never happier together. Thank you. The lesson here is it doesn't take very much to completely turn around your marriage and it doesn't take very much to neglect or destroy it and create lots of pain around you. Stay focused and consistent on the little things every day that make for magic in your marriage and magic in the results of every area of your life. If you stay focused on the small, smart choices, the compound effect of them is profound. Registering Your Rhythm I want to share with you something I created for myself that helps me keep track of the rhythm of a new behavior. I call it the Rhythm Register and I think you'll find it extremely helpful for you too. If you want to drink more water or take more steps each day or acknowledge your spouse more affectionately, whatever behavior you've decided you need to move towards your goal, you'll want to track it to see the evidence and to make sure that you're firing on all cylinders and establishing a rhythm. You can download a copy of that document for free at thecompoundeffect.com forward slash free. The Rhythms of Life When people get started in any new endeavor, they almost always overdo it. Of course, I want you to feel excited about setting up a rhythm for success, but you need to find a program that you can absolutely, positively do in the long term without renegotiation. I don't want you thinking of the rhythms you can do for this week, month, or even the next 90 days. I want you to think about what you can do for the rest of your life. The Compound Effect the positive results you want to experience in your life will be the result of smart choices and actions repeated consistently over time. You win when you take the right steps day in and day out, but you set yourself up for failure by doing too much too soon. A friend to the success team, who will remain unnamed to protect the guilty, decided after seeing a picture I'd posted of him on Twitter that he was going to get in shape. This was a Massive shift of lifestyle for him. On the job, he sits for at least a dozen hours a day, and he hates to exercise. Previously, he explained that he would find ways of avoiding using certain dishes or accessing files if it required him to squat and bend down to get them. That's how much of an aversion he had to physical activity. Still, he made a resolution to get in shape. He joined a gym, hired a personal trainer, and began working out two hours a day, five days a week. Richard, let's call him, I said, that's a mistake. You will not be able to maintain that commitment and will eventually stop doing it. You're setting yourself up for failure. He pushed back, assuring me that he changed forever. Even his trainer had recommended the intense push. I'm committed, he said. I want to be able to see my abs. Richard, what's your real goal, I asked him. I knew that he wasn't gunning to be on the cover of Men's Fitness. I want to be trim. I want to be healthy, he told me. Why, I asked. I want vitality. I want to be here long enough to see my kids have kids, he replied. These were his real, meaningful motivations. Richard wanted to be in it for the long haul. 
That meant he was signing on not for bikini season, but for a long-term commitment to fitness. Okay, I said, you've convinced me, but you're overdoing it. You're going to get two or three months down the road, and you're going to say, I don't have two hours to work out, so I guess I can't do it today. That's going to happen to you over and over again. Working out five days a week will turn into two or three, then you'll get discouraged. Soon it will be over. I know you're really fired up right now, so let's do this. Do your two hours a day, five days a week for now. It takes a lot of steam to get the wheels to budge from inertia, remember? But don't do it any longer than 60 or 90 days. Then I want you to scale it down to an hour or an hour and 15. You can still do your five days a week if you have to, but I would probably encourage you to go to four. Do that another 60 to 90 days. Then I want you to consider an hour a day for a minimum of three days a week. Four if you're feeling extra spry. That's the program I want you to work towards. Because if you don't get into something you can maintain, you won't do it at all. I really had to struggle to get Richard to comprehend this. Because at the moment, he was all gung-ho. He thought he was going to be able to stick with this new routine for a lifetime. For someone who's never worked out, to start working out two hours a day, five days a week, is a surefire dead end. You have to build a program that you can do for 50 years, not five weeks or five months. It's okay if you go strong for a while, but you've got to be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel so that you can start scaling back. You can always find 45 minutes to an hour a few times a week, but to find two hours five days a week to make your routine work, that'll never happen. Remember, consistency, that's the critical component of success. The Power of Consistency I mentioned at the beginning of this book that if there's one discipline that gives me the competitive advantage, it's my ability to be consistent. Nothing kills Big Mo quicker and with more certainty than a lack of consistency. Even good, passionate, and ambitious people with good intentions can fall short when it comes to consistency. But it's a powerful tool that you can use to launch the flight towards your goals. Think of it like this comparison. If you and I flew planes from Los Angeles to Manhattan, but you took off and had to land in every state in between, while I flew straight through, even if you went 500 miles an hour while you were in the air, and I only traveled at a rate of 200 miles an hour, I'd still beat you by a big margin. The time and energy it takes for you to repeatedly stop and start and get back to momentum makes your trip at least 10 times as long. In fact, most likely, you wouldn't even make it. You'd run out of fuel, energy, motivation, belief, will, at some point. It's far easier and requires a lot less energy to take off once and just maintain a regular speed, even if it's slower than most everyone else all along the way. The Pump Well When you start thinking about slacking off on your routines and rhythms, consider the massive cost of inconsistency. It's not the loss of the single action that you're not doing, or the tiny results that it creates. It's the utter collapse and loss of momentum your entire progress will suffer. Think of a hand-pumped water well, which uses a pipe to draw water from the water table several hundred feet underground. To get the water to the surface, you have to pump the well's lever to create suction that brings the water above ground and out the spout. When most people start a new endeavor, they grab the lever and start pumping really hard. Just as Richard was with his plan to get fit, they're excited and committed. They pump and pump and pump and pump, and after a few minutes or a few weeks, when they don't see any water or results, they give up pumping the lever altogether. They don't realize how long it takes to create the vacuum needed to suck the water up the pipe and eventually out the spout and into their bucket. Just like the merry-go-round, rocket ship, or steam engine breaking free of inertia, it takes time, massive energy, and consistency to pump water. While most people give up, wise people continue to pump. Those who persevere and continue to pump the lever will eventually get a few drops of water. This is when a lot of people say, you've got to be kidding me. 
All this pumping for what? A few measly drops? Forget it. Many people throw their hands up in defeat and quit, but wise people persist further. And here's where the magic happens. If you continue to pump, it doesn't take long before you'll get a full and steady stream of water. You have your success. Now the water is flowing. You no longer need to pump the lever as hard or as quickly. It becomes easy, actually. All you have to do to keep the pressure steady is to just pump the lever consistently. That's the compound effect. Now, what happens if you let go of the lever for too long? The water falls back into the ground and you're back to square one. If you try to pump the lever easily and steadily like you were, you won't get any water. Mo is gone. Water is at the bottom. The only way to get it back up is to pump it really hard all over again. That's how most of us lead our lives, in fits and starts. We get a new business venture going, and then we cut out on vacation. We start up a routine of making 10 prospecting calls a day, strike a little gold, and then shift into neutral. We get hopped up about our new date night routine with our spouse. But in a few weeks, it's back to Netflix and microwave popcorn on the couch Friday nights. I regularly see people buy a new book or sign up for a new program or seminar and go like crazy for a couple of weeks or even months. And then they stop and end up right back where they started. Does that sound familiar? Miss only a couple of weeks of anything. Workouts at the gym, affectionate gestures towards your spouse, or the phone calls that are part of your prospecting routine. And you don't just lose the results those two weeks would have produced. If that's all you lost, which is what most people assume, not much damage would be done. But by slacking off, even for a short time, you've killed Mo. It's dead. And that's a tragedy. Winning the race is all about pace. Be the tortoise. The person who, given enough time, will beat virtually anybody in any competition as a result of positive habits and behaviors applied consistently. That'll put the mojo in your momentum and keep it there. Making the right choice, holding to the right behaviors, practicing perfect habits, staying consistent, and keeping your momentum is easier said than done, I know, especially in the dynamically changing and always challenging world we share with billions of people. In the next chapter, I will discuss the many influences that, mostly unknowingly, can help or hinder your ability to succeed. These influences are pervasive, persuasive, and constant. Learn how to use them or you might end up losing because of them. Let me show you how. Oh, and hey, homework alert. I would be remiss if I didn't remind you to once again go back to the book. Take a look at the summary action steps so that you can get the great tips offered there about how to take all this knowledge and implement it in your life. Chapter 5, Influences. Hopefully by now, you understand exactly how important your choices are. Even those that seem insignificant, when compounded, make an extreme impact on your life. We've also discussed the fact that you are 100% responsible for your life. You alone are responsible for the choices you make and the actions you take. That said, you must also realize your choices, behaviors, and habits are influenced by very powerful external forces. Most of us aren't aware of the subtle control these forces have on our lives. For you to sustain your positive trajectory towards your goals, you'll need to understand and govern these influences so they will support you rather than derail your journey towards success. Everyone is affected by three kinds of influences. Input, what you feed your mind. Associations, the people whom you spend time with. And environment, your surroundings. 1. Input, garbage in garbage out. If you want your body to run at peak performance, you've got to be vigilant about consuming the highest quality nutrients and avoiding tempting junk food. If you want your brain to perform at its peak, you've got to be even more vigilant about what you feed it. Are you feeding it news summaries or mind-numbing sitcoms? Are you reading the tabloids or Success Magazine? 
Controlling the input has a direct and measurable impact on your productivity and outcomes. Controlling what our brains consume is especially difficult because so much of what we take in is unconscious. Although it's true that we can eat without thinking, it's easier to pay attention to what we put in our bodies because the food doesn't leap into our mouths. We need an extra level of vigilance to protect our brains from absorbing irrelevant, counterproductive, and downright destructive input. It's a never-ending battle to be selective and to stand guard against any information that can derail your creative potential. It's important to know that your brain was not designed to make you happy. Your brain has only one agenda in mind, survival. It is always watching for signs of lack and attack. Your brain is programmed to seek out the negative, dwindling resources, destructive weather, whatever's out to hurt you. So when you switch on that radio on the way to work and get bombarded with all those reports about robberies, fires, attacks, the tanking economy, your brain lights up. It now will spend all day chewing over that feast of fear, worry, and negativity. It's the same deal when you tune into the evening news after work. More bad news? Perfect. Your mind will stew on that all night long. Left to its own devices, your mind will traffic in the negative, worrisome, and fearful all day and night. We can't change our DNA, but we can change our behavior. We can teach our minds to look beyond lack and attack. How? We can protect and feed our mind. We can be disciplined and proactive about what we allow in. Don't drink dirty water. You get in life what you create. Expectation drives the creative process. What do you expect? You expect whatever it is that you're thinking about. Your thought process, the conversation in your head, is at the base of the results that you create in life. So the question is, what are you thinking about? What is influencing and directing your thoughts? The answer, whatever you're allowing yourself to hear and see. This is the input you are feeding your brain, period. Your mind is like an empty glass. It will hold anything you put into it. You put in sensational news, salacious headlines, talk show rants, and you're pouring dirty water into your glass. If you've got dark, dismal, worrisome water in your glass, everything you create will be filtered through that muddy mess because that's what you'll be thinking about. Garbage in, garbage out. All that drive time radio yak about murders, conspiracies, deaths, bad economy, and political battles drives your thinking process, which drives your expectations, which drives your creative output. That is bad news. Just like a dirty glass. If you flush it with clean, clear water under the faucet long enough, eventually you'll end up with a glass of pure, clear water. What is the clear water? Positive, inspirational, and supportive input and ideas. Stories of aspiration. People who, despite challenges, are overcoming obstacles and achieving great things. Strategies of success, prosperity, health, love, and joy. Ideas to create more abundance to grow, expand, and become more. Examples and stories of what's good, right, and possible in the world. That's why we work so hard at Success Magazine. We want to provide you with those examples, those stories, and key takeaways that you can use to improve your view of the world, yourself, and the results you create. This is also why I read something inspirational and instructional for 30 minutes in the morning and evening and have personal development CDs playing in my car. I am flushing my glass and feeding my mind. Does this give me an edge over the guy who gets up and first thing reads the newspaper, listens to news radio on his commute to and from work, and watches the evening news before going to bed? You bet it does, and it can for you too. Step 1. Stand Guard Unless you decide to hole up in a cave or on a desert island somewhere, you're going to get dirty water in your glass. It's going to be on billboards, on CNN while you're walking through the airport, on the screaming tabloid headlines at the checkout when you're buying groceries. Even your friends, family members, and your own negative mental tapes can flood dirty water into your glass. 
But that doesn't mean you can't take steps to limit your exposure to all that grime. Maybe you can't avoid the tabloids stacked up at the checkout register, but you can cancel your subscriptions. You can refuse to listen to the radio to and from work and instead put in an instructional and inspirational CD. You can cut off the evening news and talk to your loved ones instead. You can buy a DVR and record only those programs you feel are truly educational and life-affirming. And speed through the commercials aimed at making you feel inadequate or lacking unless you buy some more crap. Personally, I didn't really grow up with a TV. I remember watching Solid Gold and The A-Team. You remember them? But television wasn't really a big part of our family life. I managed somehow to thrive without it. And that's given me a clearer perspective when I do watch an occasional program now. Sure, I'll laugh along with a sitcom, but afterwards I feel the same as if I ate fast food, bloated and malnourished. And I can't get over how commercials prey on our psychology, our fears, pains, needs, and weaknesses. If I walk through my life thinking that I'm not enough just as I am, that I need to buy this, that, and the other thing to be okay, how can I expect to create amazing results? It's estimated that Americans, 12 and older, spend 1,704 hours watching TV per year. That averages out to 4.7 hours per day. We're spending almost 30% of our waking hours watching TV, almost 33 hours per week, more than one whole day each week. It's the equivalent of watching TV for two solid months out of every 12. Wow! And people wonder why they can't get ahead in life. Put yourself on a media diet. The media thrives on taking us hostage. Have you ever been stuck on the freeway with traffic backed up for miles, making you late, wondering what the heck is holding everything up? Sure enough, when you finally get close, you see that nothing physical was blocking the flow of cars. The wreck clearly happened a while ago and since has been moved to the side of the freeway. The three mile an hour crawl was caused by what? People rubbernecking. Now you're really irritated. But what happens when your car passes the wreck? You slow way down, take your eyes off the road in front of you, and crane your own neck. Why do good? Decent people want to see something tragic or grotesque. It's our genetic heritage, going back to our prehistoric sense of self-preservation. We just can't help ourselves. Even if we're adept at avoiding negativity and have trained ourselves to be relentlessly positive, when it comes to sensationalism, our basic nature can't resist. Media masters understand this. They know your nature in many ways better than you. The media has always used shocking and sensational headlines to draw attention. But today, instead of just three TV and radio networks, there are hundreds running 24-7. Instead of just a few newspapers, there are endless portals reaching us from our computers to our phones. The competition for your attention has never been bloodier, and the media jockeys continually up the ante in shock value. They find a dozen or so of the most heinous, scandalous, criminal, murderous, bleak, and horrid things that happen in the world each day and parade them through our papers, news channels, on the web, over and over. Meanwhile, during that same 24-hour period, millions of wonderful, beautiful, incredible things happened. Yet we hear very little about them. In being wired to seek out the negative, we create the demand for more and more. How could the positive news stories ever hope to compete with those ratings or advertising dollars? Let's go back to our freeway. Instead of a wreck on the side of the road, what if there was the most stunning, miraculous sunset you've ever seen? What would happen to the traffic then? I've seen this many times. It just whizzes by at top speed. The great danger of the media is that it gives us a very perverted view of the world. Because the focus and the repetition of messaging is on the negative, that's what our minds start believing. This warped and narrow view of what's not working has a severe influence on your creative potential. It can be crippling. My personal junk filter. I'll share with you what I do to safeguard my mind. But I warn you, I have a rigorous mental diet. 
You'll want to adjust to your own preferences, but this is the system that has worked beautifully for me. As you might guess, I don't watch or listen to any news, and I don't read any newspapers or news magazines. 99% of all the news has no bearing on my personal life or personal goals, dreams, and ambitions in any way. I have set up a few RSS feeds identifying the news and industry updates that do pertain to my direct interests and goals. The news that's helpful to me gets plucked out of the fray so I don't have to get any mud slung into my glass of water. While most people wade through hours of irrelevant garbage that hampers their thinking and crushes their spirit, I get the most productive information I need when I need it in less than 15 minutes a day. Step 2. Enroll in Drive Time U. It's not enough to eliminate negative input. To move in a positive direction, you must flush out the bad and fill up on the good. My car will not move without two things, gasoline and an ever-present library of instructional CDs that I listen to as I drive. The average American drives about 12,000 miles a year. That's 300 hours of flushing potential right there. Brian Tracy taught me the concept of turning my car into a mobile classroom. He explained it to me this way. By listening to instructional CDs as I drive, I gain the knowledge equivalent to two semesters of an advanced college degree every year. Think about it. Using time you're currently wasting by listening to drive time radio, you could obtain the equivalent of a Ph.D. in leadership, sales success, wealth building, relationship excellence, or whatever course you choose. This commitment, in combination with your reading routine, separates you from the herd of average, one CD, DVD, or book at a time. Influence number two. Associations. Who is influencing you? Birds of a feather flock together. The people with whom you habitually associate are called your reference group. According to research by social psychologist Dr. David McClelland of Harvard, your reference group determines as much as 95% of your success or failure in life. Who do you spend the most time with? Who are the people you most admire? Are those two groups of people exactly the same? If not, why not? Jim Rohn taught that we become the combined average of the five people we hang around the most. Roan would say, we can tell the quality of your health, attitude, and income by looking at the people around us. The people with whom we spend our time determine what conversations dominate our attention and to which attitudes and opinions we are regularly exposed. Eventually, we start to eat what they eat, talk like they talk, read what they read, think like they think, watch what they watch, treat people how they treat them, even dress like they dress. The funny thing is, more often than not, we are completely unaware of the similarities between us and our circle of five. How are we unaware? Because your associations don't shove you in a direction, they only nudge you ever so slightly over time. Their influence is so subtle, it's like being on an inner tube out in the ocean, feeling like you're just floating in place, until you look up and realize that the gentle current has pushed you half a mile down the shore. Think of your friends who order greasy appetizers or a cocktail before dinner, and that's their routine. Hang out with them long enough and you'll find yourself grabbing for cheese nachos and potato skins and joining them for that extra beer or glass of wine, matching their pace. Meanwhile, your other friends order healthy food and talk about the inspiring books they're reading and their ambitions in their business, and you begin to assimilate their behaviors and habits. You read and talk about what they talk about. You see the movies they're excited about. You go to the places they recommend. The influence your friends have over you is subtle and can be positive or negative. Either way, the impact is incredibly powerful. Watch out. You cannot hang out with negative people and expect to live a positive life. So, what is the combined average income, health, or attitudes of the five people you spend most of your time with? Does that answer frighten you? If so, the best way to increase your potential for whatever traits you desire is to spend the majority of your time with people who already possess those traits. 
you will then see the power of influence work for you rather than against you. The behaviors and attitudes which help them acquire the success you admire will begin to become part of your daily routine. Hang around them long enough and you're likely to realize similar success outcomes in your life. Let me share with you how Kathy Ireland put it, whom, by the way, is an incredibly impressive entrepreneur who stepped out of modeling and created a $1.4 billion retail sales brand. She said it this way, Do you surround yourself with anchors or engines? In life, there are engines who propel us forward, believe in us, and are supportive. And then there are the anchors who weigh everything down. It's important to stop and think, are you surrounding yourself with anchors or engines? Are you an anchor or an engine? Great advice, Kathy. So, if you haven't already, jot down the names of those five people you hang around the most. Also, write down their main characteristics, both positive and negative. It doesn't matter who they are. It could be your spouse, your brother, your neighbor, or your assistant. Now, average them out. What's their average health and bank balance? What's their average relationship like? As you look at the results, ask yourself, is this list okay for me? Is this where I want to go? It's time to reappraise and reprioritize the people you spend time with. These relationships can nurture you, starve you, or keep you stuck. Now that you've started to carefully consider with whom you spend your time, let's go a little deeper. As Jim Rohn taught me, it's powerful to evaluate and shift your associations into three categories. Disassociations, limited associations, and expanded associations. All right, let's start with disassociations. You guard against the influences your children are exposed to and the people they hang around, you are aware of the influence these people have on your children and the choices they might make as a result. I believe the same principle should apply to you. You already know this. There are some people that you might need to break away from completely. This might not be an easy step to make, but it's essential. You have to make the hard choice not to let certain negative influences affect you anymore. Determine the quality of life that you want to have, and then surround yourself with the people who represent and support that vision. Personally, I am constantly weeding out of my life people who refuse to grow and live positively. Growing and changing your associations is a lifelong process. Some people might say that I'm even too rigorous about it, but I'd like to actually be more so. I had a business relationship with someone that I really liked, but when the economy got difficult, most of his conversation was forced on how horrible things were, how much his company was feeling the hit, and how hard it was out there. I said, man, you have got to stop working on your presentation about how bad life is. I can hear you collecting all the data points to reinforce your beliefs. He persisted in seeing everything as more dour and hopeless than it was, and I decided right then that we had no business doing business together anymore. When you make the tough decision to put up boundaries between you and people who drag you down, realize that they'll fight you, especially those closest to you. Your decision to live a more positive, goal-oriented life will be a mirror to their own poor choices. You will make them uncomfortable and they will attempt to pull you back down to their level. Their resistance doesn't mean that they don't love you or want the best for you. It's actually not about you at all. It's about their fear and their guilt about their own poor choices and lack of discipline. Just know that breaking away won't be easy. Next, limited associations. There are some people that you can spend three hours with, but not three days. Others you can spend three minutes with, but not three hours. Always remember that the influence of associations is both powerful and subtle. The person you are walking with can determine whether you slow your pace or quicken it, literally and figuratively. Similarly, you can't help but be touched by the dominant attitudes, actions, and behaviors of the people with whom you spend time. Decide how much you can afford to be influenced based on how those people represent themselves.
This is difficult, I know. I've had to do this myself on several occasions, even with close family members. But I will not, however, allow someone else's actions or attitudes to have a dampening influence on me. I've got a neighbor who's a three-minute friend. For three minutes, we can have a great chit-chat, but we wouldn't mesh for three hours. I can hang out with an old high school friend for three hours, but he's not a three-day guy. And then there are some people I can hang around for a few days, but wouldn't go on an extended vacation with. Take a look at your relationships and make sure you're not spending three hours with a three-minute association. All right, now expanded associations. We've just talked about weeding out the negative influencers, and while you're doing that, you'll also want to reach out. Identify people who have positive qualities in the areas of life where you want to improve. People with the financial and business success you desire, the parenting skills you want, the relationship you yearn for, the lifestyle you love, and then spend more time with them. Join organizations and businesses and health clubs where these people gather and make friends. Later in our journey, you'll see how I even used to drive to a different town to spend quality time with fortuitous results. But before we leave this section, I have to share a story with you told to me by our success contributing editor Don Yeager, who had the privilege of being mentored by the famous UCLA basketball coach John Wooden. When Don was talking about key principles of success. Wooden corrected him on his priority of principles, emphasizing the importance of associations to one's success in life. John Wooden explained to Don his theory of five. He told Don to take out a piece of paper and draw two lines down the page to create three columns. So try this for yourself. At the top of one column, write the five people you spend the most time with in your professional life: those that you go to lunch with, hang out with after work, play golf with, whatever. The second column: the five people you spend the most time with in your personal life, go out to dinner with, have over to the house, vacation with, etc. The third column is the five most influential acquaintances or partners in service, those that you associate with at church, service clubs, associations, what have you. Now go down the list and assess each name. Is this person going where you're going? Does this person want what you want? Do you aspire to be like them? Do they share your dreams and reflect your morals and ethics? Will they help you get to where you want to be, either personally or professionally, or in service? If so, strengthen that relationship and make sure that you are giving to them as much as you are getting. If not, strike them from the list and look to add new names in replacement. You cannot maintain connections with people that will hinder your ability to become great. That is great advice from someone who knows about fostering greatness. At thecompoundeffect.com forward slash free, I'll provide you a worksheet that will help you accumulate and assess your association list. All right, back to the book. I rave about Jim Rohn throughout this book because, aside from my father, Jim remains the foremost mentor and influencer in my life. My relationship with Jim perfectly exemplifies an expanded association. While I got to spend a few private meals and spend a little time with him during our interviews and backstage before events, most of my time with Jim was spent listening to him in my car or reading his words in my living room. I've spent more than a thousand hours getting direct instruction from Jim, and 99% of that was through books and audio programs. What's exciting about this is, no matter where you are in your life, maybe busy at home with small children or caretaking aging parents, working long hours with people with whom you have little in common, or living out in the country far from the nearest office building, you too have almost any mentor you want. If he or she has gathered their best thoughts, stories, and ideas into books, CDs, DVDs, and podcasts, you have an unlimited bounty from which to draw. Take advantage of it. Now, if you want to have a better, deeper, more meaningful relationship, ask yourself: Who has the type of relationship that I want? How can I spend more time with that person? Who can I meet who can positively influence me? Let their glow rub off on you. Befriend the person you think is the biggest, baddest, most successful person in your field. What do they read? Where do they go for lunch? 
How can that association influence you? You can build these expanded associations by joining networking groups, Toastmasters, and similar organizations. Go out and find the charity organizations or symphony groups or country clubs where the people you want to emulate gather. Find a peak performance partner. Another way to increase your exposure to expanded associations is by teaming up with a peak performance partner, someone as equally committed to study and personal growth as you. This person should be someone you trust, someone bold enough to tell you what they really think about you, your attitudes, and your performance. It could be that this person is a longtime friend, but he or she may be someone who doesn't know you well at all. The point is to get and give an unbiased, honest, outside perspective. My current accountability partner is my good friend Landon Taylor. As mentioned before, we have a 30-minute call every Friday to discuss our weekly wins, losses, fixes, and ahas, and where we are on our growth plans. Just the anticipation of this call coming up on Friday and knowing that I have to be accountable to Landon keeps me extra committed throughout the week. I make a record of Landon's losses or any feedback that he needs and make sure to ask him about it the next week. He does the same for me. That way we hold each other accountable. He might say, okay, you screwed up here last week and admitted it and committed to change. What did you do about it this week? Life is life. We're both busy executives, but it's amazing to me that we actually end up doing this every week without fail. It's not easy. Sometimes I'll be flying through my day and think, oh, crud, I have to do this. But often in the middle of the call, I think, I'm so glad we're having this conversation. Even in preparing for it and thinking of my big wins or losses for the week, I learn about myself. Recently, I told Landon, you know, I'm in the middle of so many things. I'm writing my book. I'm having lots of realizations, so many ahas, but not one thing is really compelling. He said, let this be the last week you don't come to the table with an aha. Huh. Don't shortchange me, he said. Point taken. In reality, I was also shortchanging myself by not identifying one thing memorable enough to share. All right, I have a real challenge for you, if you're up to it. You want real feedback? Find people who care enough about you who will be honest with you when you ask them this. How do I show up to you? What are my strengths? Where can I improve? Where do you think I sabotage myself? What's the one thing I could stop doing that would benefit me the most? Ask those questions, get real feedback, and that will be the seed of great growth. Invest in mentorship. As you've already heard, Paul J. Meyer is another man who served as a mentor to me. Paul passed away in 2009 at age 81. Whenever I thought I was really doing things, really playing at a high level, I'd get around Paul. He was always my reality check. What he did before lunch was mind-boggling to me. I got to spend a lot of time with him. Paul bought one of my companies, and I did a turnaround for one of his companies. He was a very powerful spirit in my life. After spending a couple of hours with Paul, hearing about all his plans and ventures and activities, my head would spin. Just trying to make sense of all he had going on exhausted me. After time with Paul, I'd want to go and take a nap, but my association with him raised my game. His walking pace was my running pace. It expanded my ideas about how big I could play and how ambitious I could be. You have to get around people like that. You're never too good for a mentor. During my interview with Harvey McKay, he told me, I have 20 coaches, if you can believe it. I have a speech coach. I have a writing coach. I have a humor coach. I've got a language coach, and on and on. I have always found it interesting that the most successful people, the truly top performers, are the ones willing to hire and pay for the best coaches and trainers there are. It pays to invest in your improved performance. Finding and engaging a mentor doesn't have to be a mysterious or intimidating process either. When I sat down with Ken Blanchard, he explained the simplicity of engaging a mentor. He said, the first thing you want to remember with a mentor is that it doesn't need to take a lot of their time. The best advice I've ever gotten is in short clips, having lunch or breakfast with somebody, just telling them what I was working on and asking their advice and all. 
You will be amazed how successful business people are willing to be mentors to people when it's not taking a lot of their time. John Wooden reinforced the point that others desire to be mentors. He said, Mentoring is your true legacy. It's the greatest inheritance you can give to others. And it should never end. It's why you get up every day to teach and to be taught. He went on to explain that mentorship is also a two-way street. An individual needs to be open to being mentored. It's our responsibility to be willing to allow our lives and our minds to be touched, molded, and strengthened by the people who surround us. Develop your own personal board of advisors. As part of my plan to be wiser, more strategic, and operate more effectively, as well as to expand the time and interaction that I have with high-minded leaders, I've been developing a board of advisors in my personal life. I've hand-selected a dozen people because of their areas of expertise, creative thinking ability, and or my great respect for who they are. Once a week, I reach out to a few of them and solicit ideas, run thoughts by them, and ask for feedback and input. Having started this process, I can tell you the benefits I've already received have been profound, far more than I anticipated. It's surprising the genius people are willing to share when you show sincere interest. So, who should be on your personal board of advisors? Seek out positive people who have achieved the success you want to create in your own life. Remember this adage, never ask advice of someone with whom you wouldn't want to trade places. Influence number three, environment. Changing your view changes your perspective. When I was in real estate, working in the East Bay of San Francisco, I lived and worked within a very limited demographic. I saw the same kinds of people operating at the same level over and over. I knew that I needed to find an elevated circle of associations in order to go where I wanted to go. I started driving across the bay to one of the richest and most beautiful spots on the planet. Tiburon in Marin County, north of San Francisco. If you've ever been to Monaco, that's what Tiburon looks like, but far quainter. It's a spectacular spot. I would go to a delightful seafood restaurant called Sam's on the Wharf. The food was great, but more importantly, the restaurant was popular with the area's most affluent residents. Aside from going to Sam's to expand my associations, I'd also sit on the wharf and look up at the hillside, I was mesmerized by the multi-million dollar houses that just hung off the cliffs. One in particular always caught my eye. A blue four-story home with an elevator and a whale lightning rod at the top. While I sat there and looked up at this hillside, I used to ask myself all the time, which would be the perfect house? If someone could just give me one of them, which one would I pick? The answer was always the same, this big, beautiful blue one. It was in the perfect spot with a bright vista, the best of the bunch. On my way home from brunch one morning, I saw an open house sign and thought it would be fun to check it out. One sign led to another as I followed them zigzagging up the cliffs along the narrow streets. I finally reached the top of the hill and found the advertised home. As I entered and walked up to a spectacular bay window, the world opened up in front of me. From the peninsula tip of Tiburon, Angel Island across the bay, Berkeley and the East Bay, the Bay Bridge, and the entire San Francisco skyline over to the Golden Gate Bridge in a 300-degree expanse. I walked out onto the balcony and looked around. Suddenly, I realized that this was the very house I had been looking at for years. This was the blue house. I signed the contract on the spot. My dream house was now mine. I can't really say that I met anybody at Sam's who changed my life. However, that environment had a powerful effect on me. Seeing those homes on the cliffs fueled my ambition and expanded my dreams. I ended up working harder than I ever thought possible to make those dreams come true. And they did. The dream in your heart may be bigger than the environment in which you find yourself. Sometimes you have to get out of that environment to see that dream fulfilled. It's like planting an oak sapling in a pot. Once it becomes root-bound, its growth is limited. It needs a great space to become a mighty oak. So do you. When I talk about your environment, I'm not just referring to where you live. I'm referring to whatever surrounds you. 
Creating a positive environment to support your success means clearing out all the clutter in your life. Not just the physical clutter that makes it hard for you to work productively and efficiently, although that's important too, but also the psychic clutter of whatever around you isn't working, whatever's broken, whatever makes you cringe. Each and every incomplete thing in your life exerts a draining force on you, sucking the energy of accomplishment and success right out of you as surely as a vampire stealing your blood. Every incomplete promise, commitment, and agreement saps your strength because it blocks your momentum and inhibits your ability to move forward. Incomplete tasks keep calling you back to the past to take care of them. So think about what you can complete today. Additionally, when you're creating an environment to support your goals, remember that you get in life what you tolerate. This is true in every area of your life, particularly within your relationships with family, friends, and colleagues. What you have decided to tolerate is also reflected in the situations and circumstances of your life right now. Put another way, you will get in life what you accept and expect you are worthy of. If you tolerate disrespect, you will be disrespected. If you tolerate people being late and making you wait, people will show up late for you. If you tolerate being underpaid and overworked, that will continue for you. If you tolerate your body being overweight, tired, and perpetually sick, it will be. It is amazing how life will organize around the standards you set for yourself. Some people think that they are victims of other people's behavior, but in actuality, we have control over how people treat us. Be sure to protect your emotional, mental, and physical space so you can live with peace, rather than in the chaos and stress the world will hurl upon you. Okay, I have to arc off here and share with you one of the greatest secrets to the success of the multi-billion dollar producer, Paul J. Meyer. He revealed it in one of our recorded interviews. Here's what he said verbatim. I'm kind of what you would call an inverted paranoid. I just believe everybody in the world is out to get me and out to help me do whatever I want to do. I think everybody wants to be my partner. Everybody wants to be my customer. When I walk up to a door, I visualize a big red carpet rolled out and two trumpeteers standing on each side and the person inside is wanting to do business with me because he not only wants to buy from me, he wants to be my friend. You know, there is an amazing power in positive expectancy. And I saw this mindset played out in Paul's life over and over again. I have used this model for my own life with equally stunning results. I recommend it to you. Okay, back to the text. If you want to foster a disciplined routine of rhythms and consistency so that Big Mo not only pays a visit to your house, but moves in, you have to be sure your environment is welcoming and supportive of you becoming, doing, and performing at world-class levels. So, while we're on the topic of world-class, in the next chapter, I want to help you take everything you've learned thus far and give you the secret to now accelerating your results. Getting greater results with only a little more effort may feel a little like cheating. It certainly is an unfair advantage. But who said life was fair? But hey, before you move on, be sure to go back to the book, look at the summary action steps, and apply those principles into your life so that you can get the results you desire. Chapter 6, Acceleration. When I lived in La Jolla, California, for exercise and a test of will, I would regularly bike the two miles straight up Mount Soledad. There are very few things you can do voluntarily that cause more pain and suffering than riding a bike up a steep mountain without stopping. There's a point at which you hit the wall and come face to face with your true inner character. Suddenly, all the projections and ideas you had about yourself are stripped away and you're left with the naked truth. Your mind starts inventing all sorts of convenient alibis on why it's okay to stop. It is then when you are faced with one of life's greatest questions. Do you push through the pain and continue on, or will you crack like a walnut and give up? Lance Armstrong was the success cover feature in our June 2009 issue. 
I remember watching Lance during his first Tour de France victory. The Tour had entered the grueling mountain stages of the race. The other riders dismissed Lance because he'd never been a renowned climber. During the third mountain ascent through the freezing rains, mist, and then hail, Lance got separated from his team. He was left fighting the top climbers in the world alone. On the final ascent, 18 miles straight up the mountain, after five and a half hours of climbing, every rider was suffering. Each needed to search the depths of his stamina and self-definition. Could they endure? It became a test of who could survive the hardships and find the strength to keep going. Who would crack and who wouldn't? With just five miles to go, Lance was 32 seconds behind the leaders, an eternity while climbing a mountain on a bike. During a curb, Lance stood up and surged ahead until he caught up to the two leaders, both established world-class climbers. Having expended almost everything he had in him, Lance then launched an attack and gained several lengths on the leaders. He later said in his book, It's Not About the Bike, My Journey Back to Life, When you open up a gap and your competitors don't respond, it tells you something. They're hurting. And when they're hurting, that's when you can take them. Completely exhausted, struggling to breathe, his legs and arms burning with fatigue, Lance kept pounding on the pedals. Some tried, but no one could catch him. They just didn't have it in them. At the finish line, with fists pumping in the air, the unexpected contender won the stage race and then ultimately won the Tour de France. In this chapter, I want to talk to you about those moments of truth and how the compound effect can help you break through to new and greater levels of success faster than you ever imagined possible. When you've prepared, practiced, studied, and consistently put in the required effort, sooner or later, you'll be presented with your own moment of truth. In that moment, you will define who you are and who you are becoming. It is in those moments where growth and improvement live, when we either step forward or shrink back, when we climb to the top of the podium and seize the medal, or we continue to applaud solemnly from the crowd for others' victories. We'll also look at how you can consistently deliver more than people expect, compounding your good fortune even further. Moments of Truth Lance said in his autobiography this, There is a point in every race when a rider encounters his real opponent and understands that it's himself. He said, In my most painful moments on the bike, I am at my most curious and wonder each and every time how I will respond. Will I discover my innermost weakness or will I seek out my innermost strength? When I was in real estate, I would hit the wall several times a day. While driving to an expired listing property after just getting pummeled by the last prospect, I'd start conjuring up all sorts of excuses to skip the sales call and head back to the office. While out canvassing a neighborhood, dogs would snarl at me, or it looked like it might start to rain. I'd be in the midst of money time, that's 5 to 9 p.m., cold calling, and frequently get chewed out for interrupting somebody's dinner or favorite TV show. I was sure at that point that I needed to take a break or go to the bathroom or get a glass of water. But instead of quitting, every time I hit one of those mental and emotional walls, I would recognize that my competitors were facing the same challenges. I knew that this was another moment that if I kept going, I would be strides ahead of them. These were the defining moments of success and progress. It wasn't difficult, painful, or challenging when I was just running with the herd, just keeping up, but not really getting ahead. It's not getting to the wall that counts, it's what you do after you hit it. Lou Holtz, the famous football coach, knew it was what you did after you did your best that created victories. In one game, his team was down 42 to nothing at halftime. During the halftime break, Lou showed his team a dramatic highlight reel of second efforts to block, tackle, and recover the ball. He then told the players that they were not on his team because they could give their all on every play. Every player on every team does that. He said they were on his team because of their ability to make that critical extra effort on each play. It's the extra effort after you've done your best that is the difference maker. 
His team went on to win that game in the second half. That is how you win. Muhammad Ali was one of the greatest fighters of all time, not only because of his speed and agility, but because of his strategy. On October 30, 1974, Ali regained his heavyweight championship, beating George Foreman in one of the biggest upsets in boxing history in the Rumble in the Jungle. Almost no one, not even Ali's longtime supporter Howard Cosell, believed the former champion had a chance of winning. Both Joe Frazier and Ken Norton had beaten Ali previously, and George Foreman had knocked both of them out only in the second round. Ali's strategy? To take advantage of the younger champion's weakness, his lack of staying power. Ali knew that if he could get Foreman to his wall, he could then take the advantage. This is when Ali came up with the tactic later termed rope-a-dope. Ali would lean on the ropes, shielding his face, while Foreman threw hundreds of punches over seven rounds. By the eighth round, Foreman was exhausted. He was at his wall. It was then that Ali dropped Foreman with a combination at center ring. Hitting the wall isn't an obstacle. It's an opportunity. During Lance Armstrong's second attempt at winning the Tour de France, it was once again time to head into the mountains. The first big climb would be where Lance had experienced a devastating crash earlier that same year, giving him a concussion and breaking his seventh lumbar vertebra during a wet day in the spring. Now during race time, it was raining yet again. Instead of being concerned or hesitant, here's what Lance said. This is perfect attacking weather, mainly because I know the other riders don't like it. I believe that nobody in the world is better at suffering than me. It's a good day for me. And he was right. Lance brought home his second victory. When conditions are great, and things are easy, and there aren't any distractions, no one's interrupting, temptations aren't luring, and nothing is disturbing your stride, that too is when most everyone else does great. It's not until situations are difficult, when problems come up, and temptation is great, that you get to prove your worthiness for progress. As Jim Rohn would say, don't wish it were easier, wish you were better. When you hit the wall in your disciplines, routines, rhythms, and consistency, realize that is when you are separating yourself from your old self, scaling that wall and finding your new, powerful, triumphant, and victorious self. Multiplying your results. I have an exciting opportunity for you. We've talked about how the simple disciplines and behaviors will compound over time delivering amazingly powerful results for you. But what if you could speed up the process and multiply your results? Would you be interested? I want to show you how just a little bit more effort can add exponentially to your outcomes. Let's say that you're weight training and your program calls for you to do 12 repetitions of a certain weight. Now, if you do the 12, you're fulfilling the expectations of your program. Great job. Stay consistent and ultimately you will see this discipline compound into powerful results for you. Yet, if you get to 12, and even if you've hit your max and you push out another 3 to 5 reps, the impact on that set will be multiplied several times. You won't just add a few reps to the aggregate of your workout, no. Those reps done after you hit your max will multiply your results. You've just pushed through the wall of your maximum. The previous reps just got you there. The real growth happens with what you do after you hit the wall. Arnold Schwarzenegger made famous a weight training method called the cheating principle. Arnold was a stickler for perfect technique. He contended that once you reach your maximum number of lifts in perfect form, adjusting your wrists or leaning back a little bit to recruit other muscles to assist the working muscles, cheating a little, would allow you to do five or six more reps, which would significantly improve the results of that set. You can also achieve this by having a workout partner who assists in those last few reps you couldn't have done on your own. If you're a runner, you know this experience. You get to the goal that you set for yourself that day, and you're feeling the burn. You're at your wall. But you go a little farther, a little longer. This little longer is really a massive expansion of your limits. You have multiplied the results of that single run. Take the magic penny we talked about in Chapter 1. 
the one that doubles in value each day, showing you the result of small compounded actions. If you just doubled that penny one extra time per week during the 31 days, the compounded penny would result in 171 million instead of just 10 million. Again, just a little extra effort in four days out of 31, and the result was many times greater. That's how the math of doing just a little bit more than expected works. Viewing yourself as your toughest competitor is one of the best ways to multiply your results. Go above and beyond when you hit the wall. Another way to multiply your results is pushing past what other people expect of you, doing more than enough. Beat the expectations. Oprah is famous for using this principle, blasting beyond anyone's expectations with her generosity and ability to live and work in a big way. Do you remember how she launched her 19th season in September of 2004? When it comes to Oprah, we know to expect some fanfare, but she blew everyone away. That season opener was all the media or anyone else talked about for days afterwards. Let's go back in time for a minute. The audience members were selected because their friends and family members had written in saying how each of them desperately needed a new car. Oprah opened the show by calling 11 people to the stage. She gave every one of them a car, a 2005 Pontiac G6. Then the real surprise. She surpassed everyone's expectations when she distributed gift boxes to the rest of the audience saying one of the boxes contained a key to the 12th car. But when the audience members opened their boxes, every one of them had a set of keys. And she screamed, everybody gets a car. Everybody gets a car. While this might be her most famous example, Oprah continues to go beyond her expectations in most everything she does. In other segments of that same season opener, Oprah surprised a 21-year-old girl who had spent years in foster care and homeless shelters with a four-year college scholarship, a makeover, and $10,000 in clothes. And she gave a family with eight foster children who were going to be kicked out of their house $130,000 to pay for and repair their home. Now, you might be saying, yeah, but she's Oprah. Of course she can do those things. But the truth is, there are plenty of others in Oprah's position with the finances and the fame who could do those things but never venture out into the realm of extraordinary. Oprah does. And that's what makes her Oprah. Take a lesson from her. You can do more than expected in every aspect of your life. Now, this is a small example, but when it was time to propose to my wife, Georgia, I could have done what was expected and met with her father to ask for his daughter's hand in marriage. Instead, I decided to pay great respect to her father by preparing my speech in Portuguese. I got Georgia's sister to translate what I wanted to say. He understood English well enough, but wasn't entirely comfortable with it. All the way up to Los Angeles from San Diego, I was rehearsing the words. I walked through the door, carrying flowers and treats, and asked for her dad to join us in the living room. I then delivered my prepared speech, and thankfully, he said yes. But I didn't stop there. On the way back and over the next couple of days, I called each of her five brothers and asked for their blessing to join the family. Some were easy to convince, others proceeded to have me earn it. The point is, she told me later that one of the most special aspects about how I proposed was how I had honored her dad and how I had called every one of her brothers and had her sister teach me Portuguese. That made the act extra special. The result of that extra effort paid off exponentially. Stuart Johnson owns the parent company to success, Video Plus. Stewart put a lot of money and a 22-year reputation on the line when he decided to acquire Success Magazine, Success.com, and the other properties of Success Media. During one of the most challenging economies in recent history, and as print publishing was being seen as unfavorable, the move in itself was bold and audacious. But then he did even more than what could be expected. While the new business enterprise was still finding its legs, translation still operating in the red, and his primary business was taking a couple of steps backwards like the rest of the world during the economic tsunami of 2008 and 2009, Stewart launched a nonprofit foundation dedicated to kids. If he was going to make a commitment to helping teach the fundamentals of personal development to the world, 
He wanted to be especially sure the information would reach teenagers. So he launched the Success Foundation. He had the fundamental principles of personal achievement compiled into a book called Success for Teens and is distributing it for free through responsible distribution partners and nonprofit organizations to help nurture young minds. Stewart personally funded the administration and management of the Success Foundation and for the first year with the help of a few good friends, he funded the distribution of more than one million books. Today that number is far greater and growing. Now, Stewart was already in for a heavy investment and big risk without the burdens of funding the new foundation. But the additional contribution and dedication to the foundation multiplied the statement of his commitment several fold to his partners, to the press, to peers, and to his own staff. He was doing far more than expected, and it spoke volumes. So where in life can you do more than expected when you hit the wall? Or when can you go for wow? It really doesn't take a lot more effort, but the little extra multiplies your results many times over. Whether you're making calls or serving customers, recognizing your team, acknowledging your spouse, going for a run, bench pressing, planning a date night, sharing time with your kids, whatever. What's the little extra that you can add that exceeds expectations and accelerates your results? Do the unexpected. I'm a contrarian by nature, I know. Tell me what everyone else does, what's the consensus, and what's popular, and I will typically do the opposite. If everyone is zigging, I'm going to zag. To me, what's popular is average. It's what's common. Common things deliver common results. Let's keep in mind, the most popular restaurant in America is McDonald's. The most popular drink, Coca-Cola. The most popular beer, Budweiser. The most popular wine, Franzia. Yeah, that stuff that comes in a box. Consume those popular things and you'll now be part of the common, average pack. But that's ordinary. There's nothing wrong with being ordinary. I just prefer to shoot for extraordinary. Let me give you a small for instance. Everyone sends Christmas cards. But since everyone does it, it doesn't really have much emotional impact, in my opinion. So I choose to send Thanksgiving cards instead. How many Thanksgiving cards do you get? Exactly. It makes a statement. And instead of bulk printed, computer generated, best wishes cards, I handwrite personal sentiments expressing how grateful I am for my relationship with that person and what he or she means to me. Same effort, but a much greater impact. One of my favorite characters, Sir Richard Branson, built his career on doing the unexpected. I love to watch the guy launch a new company. Every stunt is bolder, scarier, and more unexpected than the last. Whether it's flying a hot air balloon around the globe or driving a tank down Fifth Avenue in New York City to introduce Virgin Cola to the United States, Richard always delivers the unexpected. Now, he could get by with the expected press release, a press conference or two, and some swanky party and call it a day. But instead, he goes for the astonishing. He probably spends as much money, and sometimes probably less, than other companies to launch a product. He just does it in unexpected style. The wow factor makes a statement and multiplies the impact of his efforts. More often than not, the extra effort doesn't cost that much more money or energy. When I was selling real estate, everyone else would call on expired listings when they came up. Instead, I got in my car and showed up on their doorstep and hand-delivered a sold sign. Take this, I'd say, when they open the door. You'll need it if you hire me to take over this listing. For the price it took to keep my gas tank full, I immediately and exponentially increased my chance of getting the listing. Recently, Alex, a friend of mine, was up for a big job. He lives in California and the job was in Boston. He was one of the final 12 candidates. They were going to interview the local candidates in person and those out of the area via video conferencing. He called me asking if I knew how to facilitate a webcam video conference. I asked him, how badly do you want this job? He said, it's my dream job. It's everything I've spent 45 years preparing to do. Then get on a plane and show up in person, I said. No need, Alex said. They'll be flying in the final three for the last interview. 
Listen, I told him, if you want to be in that final three, you should separate yourself by doing the unexpected. Fly across the country on a moment's notice and show up in person. That's how you make a statement. If I set my sights on something, I'm going to ensure success by going all in and all out. I launch what I call shock and awe campaigns. During this same job hunt, I suggested to Alex that he pull out all the stops, attack from every possible front, and do it relentlessly. Research all the decision makers, I told them. Find out their interests, hobbies, their kids' hobbies, spouses' hobbies, neighbors' hobbies, etc. Send them books, articles, gifts, and other resources you think they might like. Is that over the top? Heck yes, that's the point. They'll know you're trying to butter them up, but they'll appreciate your gumption and creativity. You'll certainly get their attention and most likely their respect. Then I continued, research all the people in the organization. Take that list and run it by your entire network to see if they know anyone who might know someone in this organization. Search every name against your LinkedIn database. Find a few people to connect with. Talk with them and ask them to put in a good word for you. Send them gifts, notes, and other things, and ask them to hand deliver these things to the decision makers. Phone, email, fax, text, tweet, Facebook them during the process. Could this be overly aggressive? Again, heck yes. But I have found that you may lose one out of five for being too aggressive. But guess what? You get the other four. By the way, Alex did not take my advice, and he did not get the job. He didn't even get into the final three. I can unequivocally say he was a far better choice than the person the organization ultimately hired. But Alex failed to make an impression, and it cost him his dream job. I sit on the board of a company that needed a congressman to sign off on a piece of legislation that affected whether this company could move forward on an important project. This guy wasn't budging. Not because of the actual issue, but because of a political axe he was grinding against others who publicly favored the issue. Instead of making any more futile appeals to sway him, I suggested that we go above his head and talk to his boss, his wife. We went through our network until one person led us to someone who was friends with his wife. Then we waited for her outside following a church service that she attended, and her friend introduced us. We explained our important case and cause, which was to build an after-school facility in an impoverished neighborhood that would affect the lives of hundreds of children if her husband would just support it. Needless to say, he signed on by Tuesday that following week, and the company got its project. In our attention deficit, propaganda saturated society, sometimes doing the unexpected is required to get your voice heard. If you have a cause or ideal worthy of attention, do what it takes, even the unexpected, to make your case heard. Add a little audacity to your repertoire. Doing better than expected. Invisible Children, another nonprofit for which I'm a board member, helps rescue and recuperate children who have been abducted and made soldiers in northern Uganda and the Congo. To gain awareness for their cause, they staged a 100 city event called The Rescue, where more than 800,000 young people camped outside until prominent leaders of the community came to rescue them, thus gaining their attention and support. After four days, all but one city had been rescued, having people like U.S. Senator Ted Kennedy and John Kerry, Val Kilmer, Kristen Bell, and many others show up in 99 other cities. The last city to get rescued was Chicago, and it required Oprah. After six days, Oprah was a no-show. On the fourth day, they organized a march and went round and round her studio. The next day, they put up a singing and dancing presentation that went on all day, all night. Then on the sixth day, having endured harsh weather and sleeping in the rain, the more than 500 participants surrounded her studio and stood in silence, holding signs starting at 3.30 a.m., that morning, Oprah walked out the doors of Harpo Studios and spoke with the organization's founders and invited the entire group to participate in a live broadcast segment that morning to her more than 20 million viewers. That attention got Invisible Children on Larry King Live and 232 other news outlets to reach a total of more than 65 million people. 
A bill is currently moving through Congress supporting Invisible Children's effort to save these children. The organization had already pulled off more than expected with the rescue event. But the little extra gumption and steadfastness to capture that last city and the attention of Oprah gained Invisible Children its biggest advocate to date, multiplying its results many times over. So here's the lesson for you. Find the line of expectation and then exceed it, even when it comes to the small stuff, or maybe especially then. Whatever I think the dress standard is going to be for any event, for example, I always choose to go at least one step above it. When I am unsure of the attire, I always err on the side of dressing better than I suppose the occasion calls for. Simple, I know, but just one way I try to meet my standard to always do and be better than expected. When I do keynotes for large companies, I spend a considerable amount of time preparing, learning about their organization, products, markets, and their expectations for my talk. My goal is to always significantly surpass what they expect, and I do this through tireless preparation. Doing better than expected becomes a big part of your reputation. Your reputation for excellence multiplies your results in the marketplace many times over. I did some work with a CEO once whose philosophy was to pay people, including his vendors and suppliers, a few days in advance of the contract commitment. I was always blown away when I received a check on the 27th of the month from him for next month's payment. When I asked him about it, he said, it's obvious. It's the same money, but the surprise and goodwill it will buy is immeasurable. Why wouldn't you? This is also one of the reasons why I admire Steve Jobs so much. Of all the sensational people we featured on the cover of Success, Jobs is one of my favorites. Whatever your expectations are about the next Apple product launch, Jobs always has a little, or a lot of, something extra to wow you. In the grand scheme of things, it might only be a minor addition, but even so, it's better than expected and multiplies the impression and response from his customers and deepens their loyalty. In a world where most things don't meet expectations, you can significantly accelerate your results and stand out from the pack by doing better than expected. I like the boldness of what Robert Schuller told us in his success feature. He said, I say no idea is worthwhile if it doesn't start with wow. Nordstrom is famous for this standard. When it comes to customer service, they always strive to do better than expected. Nordstrom has been known to take back an item a customer bought more than a year ago without receipt and in some cases purchased at a different store. Now why would they do that? Because they know exceeding expectations builds trust and creates customer loyalty. As a result, they've developed an extraordinary reputation that continues to attract attention. After all, I'm reminding you of it here. The multiplier keeps growing. Now, I challenge you to adopt these philosophies in your own life, in your own daily habits, disciplines, and routines. Giving a little more time, energy, or thought to your efforts won't just improve your results, it will multiply them. It takes very little extra to be extraordinary. So, in all areas of your life, look for the multiplier opportunities where you can go a little further, push yourself a little harder, last a little longer, prepare a little better, and deliver a little bit more. Where can you do better and more than expected? When can you do the totally unexpected? Find as many opportunities for wow, and the level and speed of your accomplishments will astonish you and everyone else around you. And before we conclude, one last reminder to go back to the book and implement the action steps from Chapter 6 into your life. And in conclusion, as we talked about before, learning without execution is useless. I didn't write this book for my own amusement. Hey, this is hard work or even simply to just motivate you. Motivation without action leads to self-delusion. As I said in the introduction, the compound effect and the results it will manifest in your life are the real deal. Never again will you wish and hope that success will find you. 
The compound effect is a tool that when combined with consistent, positive action will make a real and lasting difference in your life. Let this book and the audio and its philosophy become your guide. Let the ideas and strategies sink in and produce genuine, tangible, and measurable outcomes for you. Whenever you realize small, seemingly innocuous, poor habits have crept back into your life, take out this book. Whenever you fall off the wagon of consistency, take out this book. Whenever you want to reignite your motivation and bolster your why power, take out this book. Every time you read this book or listen to this audio, it entices Big Mo to pay a visit to your life. Let me jump off the text here for just a moment as we go through the concluding information. I wrote a blog post last year that stated how we needed to learn less but study more. The conundrum I think we find ourselves in, especially if you have found your way to this book, read success, or my blog, or personal development materials, is learning is not what we lack. In fact, it might be what's bottlenecking us. Beyond CDs, DVDs, and books, we also live in an age of e-zines, blogs, RSS feeds, personalized readers, Dig, Facebook, Twitter. We have a never-ending flow of ideas, tips, quotes, suggestions, and advice being continually pumped at us. We are swimming in a sea of infinite information. We paddle like crazy just to keep our nose above water. And it can be exhausting, right? We read an article and then we move on to the next. We listen to an audio and then seek out the next one. We finish a book and then start the next. Therein lies the problem. We are always reading a lot, seemingly learning a lot, but never really stopping long enough to digest, contemplate, act, review, and improve on anything we've just learned. As you know, knowledge is not power. It is the potential of power. What you do with knowledge is where the power lies. Never before have we had a society filled with so many knowledgeable failures. We do not lack for knowledge. It is everywhere, and most of it is entirely free. The problem is we expect to use all the ideas and get overwhelmed, thus becoming mentally paralyzed and are unable to act on anything. What we lack is real growth, improvement, and development. You can mistake reading and keeping up with the action as improvement. So learning is not the problem. The lack of study and implementation is. Please don't just read this book and put it down or listen to this audio and move on. Read it. Listen to this. Summarize the key ideas and then write out how you're going to implement those ideas into your life. Now act. Review and improve. Act again. Review and improve until those ideas have affected results in your life. I suggest a study and growth plan under these time parameters. First is 21 days. Pick a new discipline, behavior, or habit you want to form and then commit to it for a minimum of 21 days. 21 days is a short enough period of time to give you hope of completion and long enough to form a new habit. I also suggest that you only work on one or two new habits and disciplines at a time. That's a minimum of 17 new disciplines and habits that you can form over a period of an entire year. That will revolutionize your life. Think about it. 17 new disciplines and habits by next year. It has been said that we are one or two habits away from a major transformation. Imagine 17 of them. Second, 90 days. Pick a theme of growth to work on and then commit to it for 90 days. In Mastering the Rockefeller Habits, Vern Harness talks about having a quarterly theme for your business. I think you should do that for your life as well. This could be a get fit theme or magical marriage or servant leader or dinner time dad. Whatever significant improvement you'd like to make in your life, focus on it for a 90 day stretch. The next time chunk, three years. With focused and concerted study, I have found that it takes about three years to get good at anything you set out to improve. Our microwave, Insta Results expectation falsifies what it really takes for true transformational growth and improvement. One of the most important skills and attitudes you can develop is patience. Give yourself a break. Don't expect to be an overnight sensation. There's no such thing. Stick with your growth plan. It will pay 
huge dividends in the end. And lastly, five to seven years. This is the time that it takes to develop mastery. You can master most any skill, quality, or attribute if you study, practice, review, and improve over a five to seven year period of time. You could become world class at most anything, but it takes focused study. All right, back to the book. Let me share with you what motivates me. My core value in life is significance. My desire is to make a positive difference in other people's lives. So to accomplish my goals, I need you to accomplish your goals. It's your testimony of life-changing results that I'm after. I want to receive your email or letter, or have you stop me in the airport next year or five or ten years from now to tell me about the incredible results you've realized because of the ideas you've gained from this book. Only then will I have accomplished my goals, my objectives, that I'm living up to my core values in life. Now, for you to get those results and me my testimonial, I know you have to take immediate action on your new insights and knowledge. Ideas uninvested are wasted. I don't want that to happen. It's now time to act on your new convictions. You now have the power, and I expect you to seize it. You are ready to make dramatic improvements, right? Of course, the obvious answer is yes. But you know by now that saying you're ready to make the necessary changes and actually making them isn't the same thing. To get different results, you're going to have to do things differently. No matter where you are or what year it is when you find this book, if I could, I'd ask you these simple questions. Look back on your life five years ago. Are you now where you thought you'd be five years later? Have you kicked the bad habits you vowed to kick? Are you in the shape you wanted to be? Do you have the cushy income, the enviable lifestyle, and the personal freedom you expected? Do you have the vibrant health, abundant, loving relationships, and world-class skills you intended to have by this point in your life? If not, why? It's simple: choices. It's time to make a new choice. Choose not to let the next five years be a continuum of the last. Choose to change your life. Once and for all, let's make the next five years of your life fantastically different than the last five. My hope is that you've now removed your blinders. You know the truth about what it takes to earn success. You've got no more excuses. Like me, you too will refuse to be fooled by the latest gimmick or become distracted by quick fix enticements. You will stay focused on the simple but profound disciplines that will lead you in the direction of your desires. You know that success isn't easy or overnight. You understand that when you're committed to making moment-to-moment -moment positive choices, despite the lack of visible or instant results, the compound effect will catapult you to new heights that will astound you, bewilder your friends, family, and your competition. When you hold true to your why power and stay consistent with your new behaviors and habits, momentum will carry you swiftly forward. And then, together with that momentum and consistent positive action, it will be impossible for the next five years to be more of the same. On the contrary, when you put the compound effect to work for you, you will experience a success I'm willing to bet you currently can't even imagine. It will be incredible. I have one more valuable success principle to pass along to you. Whatever I want in life, I found the best way to get it is to focus my energy on giving it to others. If I want to boost my confidence, I look for ways to help someone else feel more confident. If I want to feel more hopeful, positive, and inspired, I try to infuse that in someone else's day. If I want more success for myself. The fastest way to get it is to go about helping someone else obtain it. The ripple effect of helping others and giving generously of your time and energy is that you become the biggest beneficiary of your personal philanthropy. As the first simple and small step, I'd like you to take in improving the trajectory of your life. I ask you to try this philosophy in your own life. If you found value in this book, if it's helped you in any way. Consider giving a copy to five people whom you care about 
and want greater success for. The recipients could be relatives, friends, team members, vendors, your favorite local small business owner, or someone you just met that you'd like to make a marked difference in their life. I know this sounds like it benefits me. It does. Remember, I'm after success testimonials. My goal is to make a difference in millions of people's lives. But to do that, I need your help. But I promise you this. Ultimately, it will be you who benefits the most. Your helping someone else find the ideas to gain greater success is the first step towards you exercising them in your own life. At the same time, you could make a marked difference in the life of someone else. This book could forever alter the course of someone else's life, and it could be you who gives it to them. Without you, they might not ever find it. So write down the five people you will give a copy of this book or audio book to, and thank you for joining me in helping make a difference in the lives of others, practicing the compound effect. I'd like to extend my appreciation and thanks to my team at Success Media and Success Magazine, who supported me through this labor of blood, sweat, and almost tears. Particularly my good friends and colleagues, Reed Bilbray and Stuart Johnson, to my writing muse and collaborator, Linda Sievertson, who helped pull out the stories and references from my past and give my process order and coherence. To the editing wizardry of Aaron Casey and the always genius touch of our Success Magazine editor Lisa Ocker, and to our editor in chief Deborah Heiss, and to my oh so patient audio producer Richard Del Maestro, who put up with my wild antics while recording this audio book and made sure that I delivered at my highest possible level for you every step of the way. To the many brilliant personal development experts that I've worked with and learned from over the past two decades, all the CEOs, revolutionary entrepreneurs, and extraordinary achievers, I've had the chance to interview and glean new insights, ideas, and wisdom from. To all the readers of Success Magazine, my blog, and my other works, whose enthusiastic and appreciative feedback inspires me to want to continue to pursue the zenith of my potential so I can better assist others to find theirs. And to my beautiful and wonderful wife, Georgia, who sacrificed many late nights and weekends without me while I worked to complete this book. And to you for honoring me with your time and attention and for joining me on this incredible journey. Now, let's go do something extraordinary. I hope you've enjoyed this audiobook and that you'll commit to using the ideas you've heard here to dramatically improve your life. Also, be sure to access the free resources available on thecompoundeffect.com to plan your path and chart your progress. Remember, the compound effect isn't about taking huge strides or unimaginable leaps. It's about consistently completing the right actions time and time again. Do that and I know you'll create the life of your dreams. And remember, when you achieve that success, send me your letter. Maybe soon we'll be sharing your success story. We hope you enjoyed this audiobook from Success Books. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Darren Hardy, and to access free resources available with this program, visit thecompoundeffect.com slash free. This recording of The Compound Effect, Multiplying Your Success One Simple Step at a Time, was read by Darren Hardy. It is published by Success Books.